my name is Kaylee, and it's been about a year since a certain show on Netflix aired. So basically, she's talking about Graham Hancock's archaeology show, and this site here is called The Dangers. Uh, sorry, History with Kaylee: The Dangers of Pseudo Archaeology, and I'm going to educate her. And I thought I would make a video in which I'm going to explain the difference between archaeology and pseudo-archaeology. And I'm going to explain the difference between numpties and liars. And what the dangers of pseudo-archaeology are to our history. And I'm going to explain the dangers of lying to us. Ignore her subscription. I certainly won't be subscribing because I don't trust mainstream, as you'll see in a few seconds when I educate you guys, sorry if it's a bit longer. I didn't, I so to explain anyway, in the very simplest of ways, pseudo-archaeology is fake archaeology. Pseudo comes from the Greek word pseuds, which means false or lying. Yes, please tell me. The prefix pseudo is used to mark something that superficially appears to be or behaves like one thing, but actually is something else. For example, Pseudo-archaeologists like to pretend they're part of the history community, like they're archaeologists researching ancient times. But their work is mostly based off of grand claims, unsubstantiated by data, exaggeration of evidence, dramatic or romanticized conclusions, use of fallacious arguments, and at times, even the fabrication of evidence. Okay, so this is someone that um, believes that people like myself are making it up. So let's have a look here. This is mainstream. Mainstream said that pre-Clovis sites in America weren't possible, uh, traditionally before um, 13,000 years. However, as you see there with the different dates, this is now accepted. So what was originally pseudoscience has now become mainstream because technology moves on, knowledge moves on. So we've got one here that's just made her look snumpty, maybe. Okay, Gebekli Tepe was another one where they said no way humans uh, could be building stuff around the time that Gebekli Tepe was supposedly built, which would have been approximately 12,000 years BC. Now, they said that can't be done because there's no way it's going to be done and you're pseudoscience. So, turns out, Mainstream have now agreed that Gebekli Tepe is as old as they say. So another tick for pseudoscience. Okay, Earth's inner core has always been a solid ball. You must know that if you went to school. However, people have been saying that they believe that it's possibly an ice core uh, or liquid. And, of course, that's pseudoscience because there's no real evidence, as she's just said. However, now... Actually, this is in Popular Mechanics, which is an important uh, site. Actually, Earth's solid core isn't all that solid. So my point is, dear lady, just because right now someone's idea doesn't have all the facts, it shouldn't be classed as... And you, let's be honest, you are trying to knock it. You're trying to say that Graham, Graham Hancock's suggestions, etc., are fake. And we've just proved... just. I could go on and on and on. We've just proved that three uh, mainstream pseudosciences are now become true. In which case, which one's which one's pseudoscience? Is it now now the pseudoscience, but yet before it wasn't, or now you get my point. So anyway, this is why I don't trust people like her. You want to know how come our moon doesn't have a name yet all the other moons in the solar system do? I've been watching him actually recently and he's not as smart as I thought he was. Uh, not that I've seen much of him before, but anyway, the few things that I've seen him now recently and uh, he keeps making mistakes. Anyway, so yes, we do have a name, even though he goes on to talk about Luna, etc. The actual original name, the people that gave all the names to all the planets were the Anunnaki. We know that because we've got the oldest text, which predates the word Luna. And we've got two names for uh, the moon. One is Kingu and the other is La. Mu, which is uh, Sumerian stroke Anunnaki language. Uh, so although he says Luna is the official one, if you want to go back and find out where, for example, Earth came from, it was Kai, guess who gave us Kai, Anunnaki. 
So I don't know why he's coming out with that. If you want to go back to the original, which is you should always go back to the original, and you can't go far wrong. Neil deGrasse Tyson says... Region of Peru. By the way, just a few days ago, I received an official invitation to Mexico to look at these two alien bodies personally. An official invitation. And I declined for a very simple reason. I, I, but I'd love to see the aliens. But if you're going to make an official invitation to a scientist, that invitation should not go to an astrophysicist. So he spends the next 10 minutes saying that uh, the people that have the bodies should be contacting biologists, etc. Not once did he, and I thought he was supposed to be smart, not once did he say, I asked whether there was other people coming at this invitation. Do you really think the people that have the Mexican bodies decided just to call you up and invite you for one day? No, they probably invited loads of people. Wow, 1.1 million for a Anunnaki alien shekel. And now the people that probably don't realise that the Anunnaki, which is the alien race that gave us money, and that's what it was, from Mesopotamia, which is where they were, they also gave us spells such as the Necrocomicon, which is how you talk to the dead. You don't think we all suddenly made all this stuff up in the Middle East, and yet nowhere else on the planet anyone was thinking of this sort of stuff? It's because the Anunnaki taught us. They even gave us our first kingship. However, what's funny is if you read Mainstream's version, it says that the first kingships were mythological because the kings reigned for 28,800 years. And of course, the Mainstream don't want us to know that the Anunnaki lived for a very long time. And they lived for a very long time because they slept seven days and seven nights here. They only lived for about 120 years on their home planet called Nibiru, or Nibru, if you want to be precise. And they lived for 120 years on their planet, but for here, if you lived here on Earth, it would be nearly a million years of our time. So it's quite easy for um, an Anunnaki to live for 20, or to be king for 28,800 years. Um, now, hang on. Oh, speaking of hanging on. Guess who was the first people to show us hanging? Yes, it was the Anunnaki. They did it with Anzu in written texts. Speaking of written texts, the Anunnaki can't be immortal, can they, because of their longevity of life? Well, let's have a look here. This is translations from the actual Sumerian language. And it, here it says, whoever is acquired, so I'm trying to read it over the phone, is destined to be lost. What mortal has ever reached the heavens what mortal and that because the anunnaki class themselves as immortal here on earth because they lived for a very very long time they were here for 450,000 years and that's not to say that they um didn't die here uh some did as we know we've got actual written records of it such as epic of gilgamesh etc but look seriously what think for a second everybody what first race of beings that can t can write wrote about what mortal has ever been uh, reached the heavens who would have wrote that in the very first language i probably would never even thought of that if my brain was wow i can now write and someone can read it and bear in mind there's probably only a handful of people that could read and write back then uh, and we're talking in cuneiform um so what mortal has ever reached the heavens and do you know what the heavens is all together now space because and forget the bible but even the bible says in in heaven we can see the sun the stars and the moon in heaven we can see the sun i can see the sun the stars wow i can see the stars and the moon wow i can see heaven everybody i am the chosen one but so can you you can also see that so it's basically heavens if you read anything uh, and you replace the word heavens with space it just makes so much more sense so what mortal has ever reached the heavens hmm see it's the anunnaki and their ships yes it's david minio again professor however if he was in a class with me i would be teaching him and i'll show you why i'll be teaching him watch this get upset when their claims about ancient history are called pseudo archaeology yeah, it starts with a P. What exactly is pseudo-archaeology? Well, the literal meaning is fake archaeology. That is something that is not archaeology, which is masquerading 
as archaeology. So this is the guy that, uh, if you remember, pretended that he debunked Zachariah Sitchin on a video. However, I've, if you've watched my videos, you see that I actually totally and utterly destroyed this man. In fact, I even emailed him um, and he never replied. And But anyway, yeah, so basically, do not trust what this guy says because I have proved him wrong when it comes to Zachariah Sitchin. Now, I'm going to prove him wrong on pseudo-archaeology. So basically, what he's doing here is he's knocking anyone that sort of throws out the ancient alien theory. Of course, I've proved it on my videos if you go and watch them you'll see that i have tens of thousands of people watched it not one person has given me evidence to say i'm wrong so these are pseudo archaeology and pseudoscience categories that are now mainstream these were called pseudoscience so when someone <coughs> i'll start with the word n and end with numpty oh sorry um when someone pretends to know absolutely everything, which is what he's doing. He's saying that no matter what happens, as long as mainstream's got it right, therefore anyone else is pseudoscience. However, these subjects here are now mainstream. So what... <laughs> it defies belief, doesn't it? So what we know now, in a year, in two years, in ten years, will possibly be become mainstream in which case people like him are once again proven wrong that there is such a thing as pseudoscience that turns into mainstream science so just bear that in mind guys if you ever see this guy um on his youtube channel it's called world of antiquity um i would personally follow me because i don't lie there's no point um i'll tell you as it is I think I've worked out where the Garden of Eden was. If you're unsure who I am and whether or not to actually listen to me, I do have a website and obviously I've got TikTok videos. But I, over 40 years, I'm the person that's actually worked out that the evidence of the crystal skulls that have been debunked is actually a lie. I've done videos showing evidence that uh, the Easter Island is not what you think it is, uh, who Jesus' real father was. I know you're all going to go, it's God. No. <laughs> Um, and the list just goes on. Gebekli Tepe explained what it was for. No one else has done this. I've explained where Atlantis is and so on and so on and so on. And not one person's debunked me. I know it sounds big headed, but I'm just telling you as it is. If you're interested, keep watching my videos because soon I will release the information on where Ad Eden, or as it was originally pronounced, Edin was. Anyone remember the 9 11 plane that was hijacked and a mum got a phone call from one of the passengers on the plane and the passenger said hi mum it's and then gave a full name not just hey i'm fred it's a full name of the person i can't remember the name and the mum found out very strange anyway she she was talking to this person that she believed was her son and in fact at one point the son said to her you do know it's me it is me mum isn't it and the mum thought that was again strange Anyway, the mum then uh, asked a question and there was some whispering in the background and then the phone uh, went dead. And she basically said that she thinks that her son's voice was cloned back in 2001. However, people said, no, there's no such thing. But Meta's now done the same thing. Excuse the dirt on the screen. Um, Meta's done exactly the same thing that they did and so has Eleven Labs. So I'm just saying... From the land of Tim. And the Emerald Tab, it starts on Atlantis, the actual island itself. Thoth's dad sends him Hang to on. the land of Kent. He calls himself an Atlantean pre- Atlantis was the whole planet. Earth was Atlantis. Everyone is- So he's gone from an island. Now, to be honest with you, there's really only two ancient places that talk about Atlantis. One is the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which the actual record that we have would have been about the 1200s from a translation of possibly older texts, and the other was Plato, who wrote stories. That's what his job was. He, he wrote many, many different books. Uh, and obviously, if you go by Plato's, then it's an island. But of course, now he's saying it's the whole planet. So I would like to see the evidence of this whole planet being Atlantis, because you've probably only got the information from Plato, who, as you watch my videos, you'll see that Plato um, made up a lot of the stuff. Riddle me this, the crystal skull that belongs to the Mitchell Hedges family, who never actually sold it, they never 
uh, charged money for it, etc., has been cast a fake. Now, they did let the Hewlett Packard Company and a few other people, such as the Smithsonian, look at it, which is pretty impressive if they believed it was fake. And of course, um, the Hewlett Packard actually said it shouldn't exist, it was so well done, certainly for the time. However, if you look down here, everyone calls it fake. And the reason why they call it fake is because the Smithsonian told them that it was fake. However, if you want to actually see the real evidence that the Smithsonian were lying, uh, feel free to watch my one hour documentary in three parts on my Patreon page, where not only do I show that the mainstream lie, that the mainstream copy the mainstream. So in other words, all it takes is one person to say they're fake and everyone then says they're fake without doing their own research. I have done my research, it's on my Patreon. So ISIS says, you know what, I've had it. I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna take the baby to... Wow, I'm, I'm waiting for the day you actually get something right. So ISIS it was the granddaughter or daughter of Marduk in Egypt. She was also the stepsister of Osiris and Seth. Now, she did not give birth to us humans. It was Nimna. Nimna. That's actually in the Oxford University translations, as well as many other translations. It's not, not me making up Nimna was the person that... Literally, I've read them out to people. They're, they're on there. You can go look them up. Um, <laughs> Isis wasn't even around 300,000 years ago. Jesus, this does my head in now it's, it's really starting to bug me uh sorry guys um so yes nimna not isis i just give up just give up this holiday season dive into the extraordinary with two captivating books that unveil the mysteries of our untold history from the anunnaki to atlantis mermaids pixies black ops aliens bigfoot giants and to the elusive men in black Unravel the secrets behind ghosts, crop circles, and much more. Be prepared for mind-bending revelations as the evidence is dissected from different angles, providing answers to the unanswered questions that have intrigued us for centuries. Evidence. Maybe in the British newspaper from 2016, the Mirror newspaper reported on a small skeleton with wings. The heading was, Mystery of winged tiny human skeletons found in basement of old London house. The paper goes on to say, In the basement of an old house in London, a chilling collection was reportedly discovered, showcasing skeletal winged beings including fairies, werewolves, and aliens. These macabre exhibits were found carefully arranged in cases and jars, presenting mythical creatures in grotesque poses. Among them were fairies with decayed flesh and wings nailed to display boards, alongside eerie alien figures and hairy humanoid remains. The hoard also contained sketches of Jack the Ripper victims Catherine Eddowes and Elizabeth Stride, along with alleged human hearts and organs preserved in jars. This disturbing collection was attributed to Thomas Theodore Marilyn, described as a wealthy aristocrat and biologist from the 1800s. According to a blog post recounting the supposed discovery in 1960, as builders prepared to demolish Marilyn's long-abandoned mansion in London for a new residential neighborhood, they stumbled upon several thousand tightly sealed small wooden boxes in the basement. These boxes contained the bodies of strange mythical creatures, seemingly plucked from the pages of fairy tales. The story of these shocking artifacts was revealed by artist Alex C.F., who claimed to be the curator of Marilyn's collection. According to C.F., Marilyn's diaries contained references to advanced ideas that were unheard of at the time, such as quantum physics and the multiverse theory. Allegedly, the diaries also provided scientific explanations for many of the mythical specimens in the collection. Now you're probably wondering if these were faked. What does the paper say about it, I hear you ask? Well, as a national paper, they claim they are fake. They should give the evidence of why they are fake. For example, the mirror paper should say, The skeletons are made up from three different animals. This was tested in the lab by Joe Bloggs. But this national newspaper doesn't give evidence why they are fake. Here is exactly what the paper says. If specimens like this had actually been found, the British Museum would have dedicated a whole wing to it. And another, called Trey Waite, added, Obviously fake, but still really, really cool. I'd love to have this stuff. That's all that was said. No evidence at all to say these were faked. Clearly, they have no evidence, just guessing or not even guessing, but maybe told to call them fake by the owners of the media empire. 
You can actually read the article and see the photos of these creatures. Search Mirror News, Weird News, Mystery Winged, Tiny Human Skeletons. Are there any small skeletons that are real, regardless of where they come from? If there are some found that are real, then surely that could mean some of these creatures around the world could have been real. Well, the answer is yes. We have two skeletons from different locations that are proved to be real. In Chile's Atacama Desert, a mummified skeleton was discovered 15 years ago, sparking speculation due to its unusual appearance. Measuring only six inches tall, the skeletal remains initially seemed consistent with a child aged six to eight years, but distinct features such as a long, angular skull, slanted eye sockets, and fewer than normal ribs deepen the mystery. The skeleton, named Atta, garnered attention as some speculated it could be an unidentified primate or even an extraterrestrial being. However, mainstream cl Crystal Skulls, my one-hour documentary split into three parts, is now available on my Patreon page. And if you've watched some of my recent videos about the Crystal Skulls, you'll see that I actually actively prove that the institutions that say they're fake are lying. And if you watch the hour version, which is here on, along with many other videos on my Patreon page, um, you'll see not only are they real, not only are we being lied to, but they do actually have special properties called to companies like uh, Hewlett Packard. If you're interested in finding out more about the Crystal Skulls, it's on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash outro history. And as you know, the way I research, I, the first thing I do is look at who's debunked things. That's the way I work. And then when you realise that the establishments all sort of, let's be honest, gets back to the Rockefellers. Uh, once, yeah, you know. Amazing news, everyone. The author of this amazing book has just released a new one on Amazon and Kindle. It's called Atlantis, Mermaids, Pixies and Our Untold History. Uh, amazing gift idea, actually, for someone for Christmas or for yourself if you're interested in these subjects. Chapter 7. Levitation. Ancient stone structures that we can't make today. The construction techniques and achievements of ancient civilizations continue to captivate modern architects, engineers and historians. While modern technology has advanced significantly, there are specific challenges in recreating certain ancient structures, especially those that involve massive stones or intricate craftsmanship. Here are a few reasons why recreating some ancient buildings presents difficulties. Many ancient structures, such as the Egyptian pyramids, Inca temples, or the temples carved out of rock in India, were constructed using massive stone blocks. Some of these blocks weigh several tons making them difficult to handle with modern cranes. Specialized equipment and techniques would be required to transport and lift these enormous stones, which are often larger than what modern construction sites typically handle. Ancient civilizations possessed knowledge and techniques specific to their time, which might have been lost or not fully understood today. The methods used to cut, shape, and transport large stones, especially in precision-cut structures, remain a mystery. Recreating these techniques exactly as they were used in ancient times is challenging, without a clear understanding of the processes involved. Many ancient structures feature intricate carvings and detailed artwork. The precision and artistic skill demonstrated in these carvings are remarkable, raising questions about the tools and techniques available to ancient craftsmen. Replicating this level of detail with modern tools while adhering to historical accuracy is a complex task. In some cases, Ancient structures are fragile and have deteriorated over time due to natural factors like weathering and human activities. Preserving these structures while attempting to recreate them can be challenging, especially when working with delicate materials or intricate design. Stonehenge, located in Wiltshire, England, is one of the most famous prehistoric monuments in the world. The site consists of a ring of standing stones, each around 13 feet high, 7 feet wide, and weighing around 25 tons. These stones are set within earthworks in the middle of the most dense complex of Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments in England, including several hundred tumuli, burial mounds. The exact method of how these stones were moved and erected at Stonehenge remains a subject of scholarly debate. However, it is generally believed that the stones were transported from quarries located in the Priscelli Hills in Pembrokeshire, Wales, approximately 140 miles away from the Stonehenge site. That's 140 miles over different terrain. Not flat concrete, but hills, rivers, and mud. There is a reason I'm mentioning all this. 
It's because I believe I know how the huge blocks were moved. Each of the ancient sites around the world has quartz in them. Quartz is the only connection between all of those ancient sites. Quartz is a special mineral for several reasons, making it valuable in various scientific, industrial, and commercial applications. Here's what makes quartz special. Crystal structure. Quartz crystals have a unique and well-defined hexagonal structure, giving them symmetry and clarity. This structure is one of the reasons why quartz crystals are often used in jewelry and decorative items. Quartz exhibits piezoelectric properties, meaning it generates a small electrical voltage when mechanical stress is applied. Conversely, it deforms when an electric field is applied. This property is utilized in electronic components like quartz crystals in watches and oscillators, enabling precise timekeeping and frequency control. Quartz is stable at high temperatures, making it suitable for applications involving heat, such as in manufacturing processes and scientific experiments. It does not undergo significant expansion or contraction at different temperatures. Quartz is transparent to both visible and ultraviolet light. This property makes it valuable in optics and lenses, including microscopes and cameras, where its clarity and lack of distortion are crucial. Quartz is resistant to most chemical reactions, including those with acids and bases, making it useful in chemical laboratories and industrial settings. It does not readily react with common chemicals, ensuring its durability and stability in various environments. Quartz is one of the most abundant minerals on Earth, found in a wide range of geological environments. This abundance makes it economically accessible and readily available for various applications. Although it is one of the most abundant minerals on Earth, it doesn't mean it's everywhere. If it did, then the blocks from Stonehenge wouldn't have come from over 140 miles away. Quartz occurs in a variety of forms, including clear quartz, amethyst, citron, and rose quartz, each with its unique color and properties. These different forms are valued in jewelry and as collectible specimens. Quartz has spiritual and metaphysical significance in many cultures. It is believed to have healing properties and is used in meditation and energy work. Its clear and pure appearance symbolizes clarity of thought and spirituality. Quartz resonance frequency refers to the specific frequency at which a quartz crystal vibrates when an electrical voltage is applied to it. Quartz crystals exhibit a property called piezoelectricity, which means they can generate Fake. National Geographic, all of the famed crystal skulls are likely fakes. Discovery Magazine, fake Aztec crystal skulls, are found in museum collections around the world. They can all be traced back to one man, even though there is no evidence of the one man making any. Chemistry for Life, how science debunked the ancient Aztec crystal skull hoax, yet zero evidence of them being a hoax. Smithsonian Magazine, how science debunked the ancient Aztec crystal skull hoax, NBC News, heads up, real Indiana Jones crystal skull might be a hoax. The New York Times, Indiana Jones and the fake crystal skull. There's many more, but they all point to the Smithsonian as their evidence. The reason why we can work out the Smithsonian is wrong, or even lying, is because Eugene Bobin died in 1908. But yet the crystal skull, known as the Mitchell Hedges skull, or known as the skull of doom, was reportedly discovered by Anna Mitchell Hedges, the adopted daughter of British adventurer and explorer F.A. Mitchell Hedges in Lubantun, Belize, in 1924. Anna Mitchell Hedges claimed that she found the crystal skull under a collapsed altar in a Mayan temple during an expedition led by her adoptive father. This means that either the father Mitchell or daughter Anna had acquired in some way one of the skulls made by Eugene before he died around 16 years before the Hedges found their skull. It's possible that the Hedges brought the skull from someone that Eugene had sold it to before he passed, but again, why only make one or two? If he was selling them, make more. The Hedges skull was never sold and Anna's husband had it after she passed. Her husband is Bill Homan, so where's the scam from the Hedges skull? They didn't sell it, they didn't charge people to look at it, tell me, where's the scam? The British Museum's Aztec skull, acquired in 1897, is believed to have passed through Eugene Bobin's hands. Yes, once again they believed, no evidence. Anyone else thinking they used Eugene Bobin's name to make people think he was making them? But even if Hedges' skull was made by Eugene, and they would have been aware of, of it, 
because they would be lying about finding in in a temple, then why not sell it? The skull remained in the possession of F.A. Mitchell Hedges and Anna, who asserted that it possessed mystical powers. They showcased the artefact at various public events and exhibitions, captivating audiences with its purported supernatural qualities. Following F.A. Mitchell Hedges' passing in 1959, ownership of the skull transferred to Anna. Continuing her father's legacy, Anna displayed the skull extensively during her lifetime. After Anna's death in 2007, the skull came under the care of her companion, Bill Homan. He kept the skull privately, occasionally exhibiting it at conferences and events related to crystal skulls. They could have sold the skull but didn't. What was the point in them buying a fake skull, knowing it was fake because they wouldn't have found it in the temple, then doing nothing with the skull? The Hedges must have worked out that if they brought a fake, then whoever made it would have made loads and could have flooded the market or even been caught making the skulls. Yet no one ever have been found making the skulls and Hedges family treated the skull as if it was real, keeping it in their care. They did let one person examine their skull. Archelagoy.com said this, The Mitchell Hedges, formerly Bernie Quartz skull, is modern, like every rock crystal skull that has been examined so far. Sachs 2008-2009, Walsh 1997-2008. I believe this one can rightly be called a fake, since it is almost surely an improved version of the British Museum skull, making it a copy of an invented artefact. As such, it was intended to deceive. They claim that because the Hedges skull appeared superior in construction, it must be a newer version of Eugene's. Still, we have no evidence Eugene even made one, let alone better versions. The problem with this comment about one being better than another is that the real skulls, there has now been fakes made in modern times, are made of different types of crystal and show different types of skulls. None of them are the same. They are often crafted from natural minerals or stones. The common materials used for crystal skulls found in museums include quartz crystal. Crystal skulls are frequently carved from quartz crystal, which can be clear, rock crystal, smoky quartz, brown to black, amethyst, purple, citrine, yellow, or rose quartz, pink. How each of these crystal skulls can be defined as newer because it's better is beyond me. Each of the ancient skulls are all perfect, so there's no defects to use as comparison, there's just simply different designs of skulls. The Hedges skull is closest to the Homo sapien skull, I guess that's why they said it was the newest of them all. But when you look at the other skulls you can clearly see they were made as different skulls. The recent evidence has come to light showing that F.A. Mitchell Hedges purchased the skull at a Sotheby's auction in London on October 15, 1943, from London art dealer Sidney Burney, 26, in December 1943. F.A. Mitchell Hedges disclosed his purchase of the skull in a letter to his brother, stating plainly that he acquired it from Burney, but, if you dig deeper you'll find what I found. The 1943 auction of the skull of doom certain people have made a lot about how Mitchell Hedges bought the skull at auction in 1943. But this revelation takes the focus away from the fact that the skull is known to have existed in 1936, when it was studied by the British Museum. The report stated that it could not trace the skull's existence beyond 1934. You can see the original 1936 paperwork here https colon double forward slash crystals coles dot com forward slash mitchell dash hedges dash controversy dot html if you notice the two dates 1936 first mention of the skull and then 1943 when hedges supposedly brought it from them the initial mention of the mitchell hedges skull in print occurred in july 1936 within an article in man a monthly record of anthropological science published under the royal anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. In this article, G. M. Morant and Adrian Digby from the British Museum compared the Burney skull, known as the Mitchell Hedges skull at the time, with a similar skull in the British Museum's collection. Their analysis did not yield conclusive results, they were unable to determine which skull was created first or establish any definitive relationship between the two. The origin of the British Museum's skull remained obscure although there were speculations that it might have originated from Mexico. This is so stupid that anyone would believe this, if Hedges brought the skull from the most famous auction house in the world. Then pretended he found it in a Mayan temple. 
Really, who believes anyone would buy the skull using his real name and then claim to the world he found it, there might be some trickery going on here. I wonder if the recent find of the documents that say Hedges brought it in 1943 were fake. But why would Sotheby's fake a document, it's not like they are run by the Rockefellers is it, there is a historical connection between Sotheby's, the renowned auction house, and the Rockefeller family, one of the wealthiest and most influential families in the United States, Nelson A. Rockefeller, the grandson of John D. Rockefeller, Sr., and a prominent member of the Rockefeller family, was involved with Sotheby's. In 1937, Nelson Rockefeller co-founded a subsidiary of Sotheby's called Puck Burnett, named after his maternal grandfather's art dealership in New York. Pock Burnett became one of the leading auction houses in the United States, eventually, in 1964, Sotheby's acquired Pock Burnett, solidifying the connection between the Rockefeller family and Sotheby's. Nelson Rockefeller served as the U.S. Vice President under President Gerald Ford from 1974 to 1977. This connection played a role in the history of both Sotheby's and the Rockefeller family's involvement in the art and auction business. Oh, so they are connected. How easy would it be for someone to knock up a document saying Hedges brought it, very easy, then once people believe he brought it, no one will care anymore and the whole story goes away, but we know museums still have them on show. I recently done a video uh, showing Billy Carson talking about who the mother goddess of the first humans was and he said it was Isis and I said no it wasn't. So I've just found another video where he actually explains why he thinks that uh, Isis the female Egyptian person was the person. So let's just have a listen and I'll break it down and maybe I'll try and help Billy out because I think he's got it wrong. An Egyptian, Sumerian, and she's holding up a baby and she's... So first, first of all he says Isis was um, Sumerian. There's no record of uh, Isis back then in Sumerian. I, I don't know where he's got that from but... And also have a look here, the elongated skull, that's important in a second. It says, the first Adamu, which means first man, my hands have created it. So he's saying this text in the British Museum, along with that uh, carving, saying that Isis has created the first human. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know about Billy, I don't have an elongated skull. Now, we do know that there was elongated skulls in Egypt, not many. In fact, it was the lineage of... Um, Nefertiti and Akhenaten and Tutankhamun and his parents and their grandparents etc. So we know that the elongated skull did come into existence way nearer to our time than two to three hundred thousand years ago which is when the first Homo sapiens would have been created. So we've got a bit of a discrepancy there. Um, so Isis, the first mentions of Isis was around this time here again not 300,000 years ago but only 2,350,000 uh, years ago so we're talking a humongous difference for the first time that she was mentioned and of course when she was first mentioned there was already humans here so there now seems to be a bit more of a discrepancy and of course um, when you actually look at Isis's uh, lineage Ra which would have been Marduk the sun god um, in Egyptian times and then he had some children and they had some children, and then eventually we get down to Isis. <clears throat> so that would have been Marduk. Now, Marduk actually married a human woman, or Ra did, um, so, and she was a scribe. That's all written. So how did Isis create the first human when Ra, Marduk, married the first, well, married a, a human person? That also doesn't make sense. And also here we've got actual translations from the Sumerian, not from Egyptian, because obviously he's gone by the Egyptian, where literally it says Nimna. There's loads and loads of these translations of different texts, but basically Earth Mother Goddess, and they're talking about here how they will mix the clay, etc., to create the first human. So uh, that doesn't say Isis, that says Nimna, which was also known as Ninhasag and also known as Ninta, uh, Nintu. So, I think where Billy's is going wrong is, um, yes, there was a genetic creation done in Egyptian times with that child with the elongated skull. And that more than likely was what the, uh, she, Isis was referring to, um, saying that she's created a first creature. Um, but it's not 
uh, the direct Homo sapien, it may be another Adamu. Um, well, technically, Adamu, A D A M U. Uh, I don't know whether that's Google or YouTube translating that wrong, but either way, um, I don't have any elongated skull, and hopefully, you don't. But the ones that did were nearer to us than 300,000 years ago when the first Homo sapiens came. So Adam and Eve grew up on a spaceship for 24 years. Yes, I've done it again. Another amazing documentary that's just been released literally two seconds ago. It's 20 minutes long. It's part two of the Adam and Eve Garden of Eden story. Uh, if you know anything about my research, you know I'm pretty darn good. And on my Patreon page, I have so many more other things like the crystal skulls I prove that we've been lied to. The list just goes on on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash outro history. And these are long documentaries, as I say, uh, some of them are split into different parts, um, and that's 15 minutes, so the whole of that one's nearly an hour long, just to do with the crystal skulls. So if you're interested in finding out really who was Adam and Eve, and what they were doing, and why there was two gardens and two trees, yes, two trees that they're referring to. It's all in the video. Enjoy. Adam and Eve. Is this person here with no beard Adam? That's Ningazida um, teach showing this person with no beard to King Anu on Nibiru. So is this Adam? Now if it is, it means he's the same height as these Anunnaki, which were 8 to 12 foot tall. And we know all of this because we've got the actual text. So not just that cylinder seal we just saw there, but here... Um, King Anu sends him back. Look, take him and bring him back to his earth. The whole thing there is about Adam not eating food uh, that was offered to him by King Anu. So we've now got possibly the description, because normally uh, Anunnaki's have beards. And obviously we know that he was led to King Anu from the ancient text that I just showed you. So is this the first, not the first human, but the first half bread as you may know i have a patreon page which has over 100 documentaries long documentaries on all sorts of things from spirits crystal skulls and i break them down properly and i show you where mainstream lie etc and the most recent one i've just done uh, is part one part two will be out next week is garden of eden adam and eve and yes i break down exactly where I believe Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, where Garden of Eden was and who Adam and Eve was. So let's just have a look at part of this video that I've done that you can go watch on my Patreon page. To wrong. This researcher is called Billy Carson. The Garden of Eden was a laboratory, an outdoor laboratory. He does continue, but let's break his comments down one at a time. He says the Garden of Eden was a laboratory. I guessing his logic behind this is because when the first humans were created by the Anunnaki, they would have been made in a laboratory. However, the first humans created were not Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve came along 200,000 years after the first human and were genetic offspring from a human and Anunnaki. The very first Homo sapien was called Adamu. This is why people get mixed up with Adam and Eve. The term Adamu is often associated with ancient Mesopotamian cultures, particularly in Sumerian texts. In Sumerian, Adamu refers to a type of being created by the god Enki, also known as Ea. These beings were fashioned from clay and infused with the breath of life. It's important to note that the Sumerian concept of Adamu is distinct from the biblical Adam in the book of Genesis. While there are some similarities, such as the creation of a human-like figure from clay, the cultural and religious contexts differ significantly. In Sumerian texts, the Adamu were often created to serve the gods or perform various tasks. One notable example is the creation of the first humans in the poem known as Enki and Ninma or Enki and the Making of Man, where Enki, the god of wisdom, and Ninma, the mother goddess, engage in a competition to create various beings, including humans, Enclosed and had guards at the gates. It even tells us there were guards at the gates in the modern day Bible. What do you mean? To keep them in and keep everybody else out. I believe he's now talking about the Garden of Eden. I think he's assumed the lab and the garden are the same place. I'll explain why they are not later. 
So they would put humans in a garden as if it was a laboratory to watch them grow like fruit. They would give them times that they could mate and times that they couldn't mate. This is all written in text. Uh, they were treated like animals. When they created Adam, they created what they had hoped to be a version of a human that can replicate easily. So after they created him, they then tried to mate him with one of the existing hominids that they had modified. But it was more like a clone and it still wasn't able to reproduce. I've not seen any ancient texts where they said that. The logic that you've just created a smarter creature to do the work for you, then you let it breed with the dumber creatures, that doesn't make sense at all. Obviously I go on and prove uh, that what you said was uh, illogical. So yeah, so if you're interested in learning more on any of these subjects, my Patreon page um, is amazing. It's got uh, audio books on there and everything. Uh, so it's patreon.com forward slash outro history and there's over 120 videos there, documentaries, long ones. So hopefully you'll enjoy them. I'm sure that many of you know that the name of the God of Israel is Yahweh. So it's a bit of a come down, isn't it, from creating the universe and even the planet that people worship you on to being called just the God of Israel. I mean, you, could, you might as well be called the God of uh, New York or the God of something else. Now, it does say that Yahweh was to do with the Hebrews and the Israelites, and therefore, obviously, that's their version that you're reading in the Bible, which makes sense, because if he was Babylonian and Babylonian people wrote about it, then that would be to do with Marduk, who was the god of Babylonia. But, of course, it's whoever wrote the Bible is what they're talking about. Now, we know that the Anunnaki called themselves gods, and they had many gods and goddesses, which was basically the race name for the Anunnaki that came here. And they're the ones that created us in their images, plural, Genesis 126. So I'm suggesting that... Yes, here's another one. <laughs> this person uh, basically said, I'm wrong. And I said, no problem at all. Tell me where I'm wrong. You know, what videos got the wrong evidence? And uh, basically the person said he hasn't watched any of my videos. <laughs> so I said, so how can I be wrong? And then he started waffling on about Satan. And that he's found the light and all this kind of stuff. And I thought I'd do a video just to point out that if he actually reads the Young's literal translation, not the changed versions of the Bible, you'll find that Satan was actually not a word. It was actually just an adversary. Obviously, this person hasn't bothered doing that kind of research. So, because he doesn't even know the simple fact that Satan wasn't even a real word, wasn't a character until way later on when people started to give a name to the adversary and a backstory, um, this person is sadly mistaken. So, yeah, what a shame. This is the same person from the last video saying that Noah's Ark, even though I've showed evidence that Noah's Ark was actually made out of wood, we've got the original tablets in the British Museum, so this person is clearly wrong. But I'm asking this person to show me evidence, evidence that it was a spare. Polaris stays in the exact same spot in our night sky and during the day we just Have you ever been in a car or a plane when you're looking at the moon and the moon doesn't move the moon just stays exactly where it is And the same principle applies for something further away the further away it is the less it looks like it's moving Now out of all the visible stars that we can see is it not conceivable that one actually has an orbit in its own solar system that actually makes it appear that it's staying still, even though, obviously, as far away as it is, it is moving. But for us, we can't see that same principle with the, the moon. It looks like the moon is staying dead still, but actually over a few minutes, it's not. It's moved and we've moved, but it looks like it's staying in the same position. So is it not possible that one star has the same, uh, not the same orbit, but the or an orbit that makes it gives the appearance that it's staying where it is? you see the truth is in front of your eyes our true history babbling lies street is lies oh yeah digging deep discovering secrets untold
I've been chatting to this person who believes in an almighty being and I've said, you know, would you like to see the evidence that the almighty being is actually the Anunnaki with evidence? And of course that person has refused it. So this person is saying, if you're gods, which is plural because they were the Anunnaki, it's, we've got the evidence, I can show anyone the evidence, I have showed the evidence and not one person said the evidence is wrong. That's probably why this person doesn't want to see the evidence because knows that. Anyway, if your gods, in other words, the Anunnaki, exist, why aren't we seeing wars in the universe? So this person is expecting Star Wars, expecting that an advanced race has to have a fight, and not only have a fight, have a fight close enough to us so that we see. So the logic there isn't quite there, I'm afraid. Um, sorry. Chapter 9. Telekinesis and Amp Telepathy Telekinesis, often portrayed in popular culture as the ability to move or manipulate objects with the mind alone, has fascinated humans for centuries. Stemming from the Greek words tele, meaning distant, and kinesis, meaning motion. Telekinesis implies a form of psychokinesis where the mind influences physical matter or events. Despite its prevalence in movies, books, and folklore, scientific evidence supporting telekinesis is sparse. Parapsychologists, researchers who study paranormal phenomena, have conducted experiments attempting to demonstrate telekinetic abilities, but results have often been inconclusive or subject to criticism. One of the challenges in studying telekinesis lies in its unpredictable and subjective nature. Unlike other scientific phenomena, telekinesis, if it exists, seems to occur sporadically and inconsistently, making it difficult to study under controlled conditions. In popular culture, telekinesis has been a popular theme in science fiction and fantasy. Iconic characters like Carrie White from Stephen King's novel Carrie and Jean Grey from Marvel Comics' X-Men series possess telekinetic abilities. These portrayals often depict individuals moving objects, altering the physical environment, or even exhibiting immense power by controlling external forces. As research and understanding of the human brain progress, the mystery surrounding telekinesis may one day be unraveled, but for now, it remains a captivating enigma in the realm of human potential and the unexplained. I'm going to mention Yuri Geller. I know people believe he's been debunked, but wait till you read all of this, then make your mind up, because you know I'll be showing you that the debunkers are not always correct. Yuri Geller, born on the 20th of December, 1946, is an Israeli-British entertainer renowned for his skills in illusion, magic, and television presentations. He identifies himself as a psychic and is particularly famous for his televised acts featuring spoon-bending and other illusions. Over his extensive career, spanning more than four decades, he has appeared on numerous television shows and stages across various countries. Despite his popularity, some magicians have labeled Geller a fraud, casting doubts on his claims of possessing genuine psychic abilities. However, let's look at Yuri's early life. In 1973, a study conducted by the CIA reported that Yuri Geller had demonstrated his paranormal abilities in a convincing and unmistakable manner. Declassified CIA documents revealed that the U.S. Stanford Research Institute had conducted secret tests on Geller's psychic skills for eight days as part of the agency's Stargate program, which aimed to investigate psychic powers and their potential military applications. During these tests, scientists employed various image and word exercises. A random word, such as fuse, was chosen from the dictionary, and a scientist drew a corresponding image like a firecracker. This drawing was then placed outside a sealed room where Geller, relying solely on his paranormal abilities, replicated the same image. Geller expressed his validation when the classified documents were made public, stating that he had undertaken several tasks for the CIA including erasing floppy disks flown out by Russian agents and influencing individuals to sign important documents. However, critics of the CIA's Stargate experiment raised concerns about the methodology and accuracy of the research. They pointed out discrepancies and a lack of consensus among the viewers' reports, leading to skepticism regarding the results. You can see Geller's name on the CIA website. Telekinesis document type, Crest Collection, Stargate, https semicolon slash slash www.cia.gov slash reading room slash document slash NSA. RDP 96X00790R00010040012. Date 1973. The Stargate program, despite its
creating Asians, this, that, you know, everybody was one, then became, I'm Asian, I'm an African, I'm a... Billy's referring to the Anunnaki after the Tower of Babel incident, which we all know that they changed their language, but Billy's saying that they actually changed the characteristics of the people, so they ended up becoming Asian, African, Indian, different colours, different cultures, and everything else. Now, unfortunately, I'd, I've never seen the evidence of that, and I would really like to see that, Billy. But what I have seen is evidence that different hominids around the world had bred with different hominids. So in other words, Homo erectus has bred with Neanderthal, humans bred with Homo erectus, and so on, which is where you get all the different uh, different styles of people. Not because the Anunnaki genetically went round and modified every single person, that I, I can't see happening. So if you've got any evidence of that, anyone, that Anunnaki genetically modified different races, let me see it. Hey guys, I'm one of the foremost world leader in the knowledge on ancient texts and tablets, scriptures, papyrus, and the Zillian Scrolls. And guess what? It all... So <clears throat> Billy's just said that he's one of the foremost leaders. The only problem I have with that, and, I, and no disrespect to him, is um, I show evidence uh, he does a lot of sound bites and unfortunately the sound bites that he's done i've picked holes in i could probably do it virtually on every video and i show evidence where his comments are wrong so in order to be one of the foremost you can't have people like myself finding errors and actually showing the evidence where your comments are wrong now obviously if you showed evidence then that would be different um so if someone's pointing out your errors then surely that one then would be the foremost expert no i don't know maybe i'm wrong i'm ashamed to tell you this story but it's a true story and it comes from ivan finkel who is the creator of the british museum and he's got these uh, sumerian tablets and there's one particular cuneiform tablet that talks about an assyrian person who writes to a pharaoh in egypt and he says, how are you? How's your family? How's your livestock? Blah, blah, blah. By the way, I still haven't been paid for my daughter. So basically, this guy had sold his daughter to the pharaoh. And this happened all the time in the newer period, not necessarily when the Anunnaki were around. So this is way later. This is um, about 800 BC. Uh, so this basically, this pharaoh stushed him and kept his daughter and the actual um, video, if you want to go and watch it, it's brilliant. It's called Ivan Finkel, and there's a cat there. Voices out of the darkness. Chapter 10. Atlantis. Before I go into detail about where it was and who lived there, we need to look at where Atlantis is mentioned in ancient times, so that we can see why other researchers are looking in the wrong place. Some of the most notable mentions of Atlantis include Plato's Dialogues, the earliest and most significant reference to Atlantis can be found in two of Plato's works, Timaeus and Critias, written around 360 BC. In these dialogues, Plato describes Atlantis as an advanced civilization that existed around 9,000 years before his time, which had conquered much of Western Europe and Africa before ultimately being lost to the sea. Ancient Greek and Roman writings. Some other ancient writers, such as Pliny the Elder and Strabo, also made passing references to a land or island that might be interpreted as an early reference to Atlantis. The Egyptian priest in the Critias dialogue. Plato tells a story in Critias of an Egyptian priest recounting the history of Atlantis to the Greek statesman Solon, which was then passed down through generations. Ignatius L. Donnelly's Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, 1882. This work is one of the most famous modern books on the subject of Atlantis. Donnelly gathered various ancient sources and argued that there was an advanced civilization in the Atlantic Ocean that was destroyed in a cataclysmic event. Edgar Cayce's readings. The famous American psychic Edgar Cayce claimed to have access to information about Atlantis in his trance-like state. His readings suggested that Atlantis was an advanced civilization with incredible technology and spirituality that ultimately fell due to its misuse of power and technology. The Emerald Tablets of Thoth are a series of ancient Egyptian texts that have become a part of the Western esoteric tradition. These tablets are attributed to Thoth, the ancient Egyptian god of wisdom and writing, who was believed to be the author of various mystical and magical texts in Egyptian. Some translations say Thoth was an Atlantean. As mentioned, 
Plato is a huge part of the story around Atlantis. We have to rule his account out, unless we can find other evidence to match what he says. I'll explain why in a moment first. Let's look at who Plato was. Plato, 428, 427, or 424, 423, 348, 347 BC, was an ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician known for being one of the most influential figures in Western philosophy. He was a student of Socrates and the teacher of Aristotle. Plato founded the Academy in Athens, one of the earliest institutions of higher learning in the Western world. His philosophical works, such as the Republic and the Symposium, explored various topics, including ethics, politics, metaphysics, epistemology, and the theory of forms. Plato's ideas have had a profound impact on Western thought, and his works continue to be studied and debated by scholars and philosophers to this day. Plato wrote numerous dialogues and letters throughout his lifetime. His works are typically in the form of dialogues, featuring his mentor Socrates as the protagonist in many of them. Some of his most famous works include The Republic, a dialogue discussing justice, the nature of the just individual and the just state, and the role of the philosopher in society. Symposium, a philosophical text exploring the nature of love, featuring various speeches by different characters discussing the concept of love. Phaedo, a dialogue recounting the final days of Socrates, particularly focusing on his thoughts about the immortality of the soul. Phaedrus, a dialogue addressing the nature of rhetoric, the soul, and the power of love. Apology, a record of Socrates's defense. This video I'm about to record is really important. It basically proves who Jesus' father was, as already done by myself, but it backs it up. So I've already done a video called Jesus' Real Father Named. It's on YouTube, you can go watch it. It's on TikTok, etc. Jesus' Real Father. Now, in that, I said that Marduk was the person that ended up wanting to be uh, monotheism and that Marduk, I'm not spoiling it, but Marduk was uh, Jesus' father. Now, it was an educated guess. Now here, in what I'm about to show you, shows that Marduk was around at that point and did want monotheism. So just watch this. This is Ivan Finkel, curator of the British Museum, talking about a particular tablet. And Cyrus had this marvellous cylinder written out to explain the difficult thing to the Babylonians, the Iraqis, that from now on, a person was going to be in charge. And the way he did it was he wrote an inscription on this famous cylinder explaining how the Babylonian god Marduk had picked him out over the border in Iraq, what it was Iran, it was Persia, picked him out, singled him out and said, Cyrus, when you grow up, you are going to be um, king of Babylon under my protection. So he put the invasion cleverly as being due to the king of Babylon. Marvel, a master stroke. And it's such an important text that this was loaned to the Tehran Museum a few years ago. It's the first time it had been there. And there was a tremendous response. You can see all the photographers going like it's a film star. And in the way, it's a kind of film star. It's such an important thing. So there we are, the Cyrus Cylinder. It's now safely back in the museum. So basically that proves that um, Marduk was still around at the period where Jesus would have been created. And now this is the next bit on a different ta uh, tablet. Have a listen to this. God. And um, in this officious and, and, and straightforward fashion, they were literally absorbed into Marduk as the one God. And it is the beginning of the idea of monotheism. It is the moment when poly, poly, um, polytheism, pantheism in Mesopotamia, with so many gods and goddesses, um, evolved massively down into the idea that you have a single deity into which they are all absorbed, and in due course, um, is a crucial contributor to the Abrahamic, the um, monotheistic religions of um, Judaism, Islam and Christianity. So absolutely everything I've already said, now with evidence, that Jesus' father was Marduk, 
was the monotheism watch the video because i go through it it's 20 minutes long it's a documentary i made it's on youtube and i explain why um marduk ended up wanting monotheism it's to do with egypt it's to do with uh, his ego and everything else um so i think now that this video here is is um been basically approved by the, <laughs> by the british museum so thank you, I'm very proud of my set my research here as always. I'm shocked. This person's told me to go away and watch Ancient Aliens to Learn. He's also said on another post that my research is out of date. Uh although this person follows me, clearly he hasn't actually watched any of my videos. So instead of me saying, hey, I'm the one that tells ancient aliens where they're wrong with evidence, I'm the one that shows where the other researchers are wrong with evidence, pretty much I'm the one I'm the main guy without sounding big headed. Um so instead of me going through and explaining to this person that, you know, really what you should be doing is watching my videos instead of listening to other people, um, I thought I'd just let anyone that follows me uh, just post up and say whether or not you feel that my research is up to date and probably the best. Uh, if you don't feel that, obviously write that, but, uh, you know, please um, be honest and uh, let this person know, because I don't want this person to keep telling me to go and watch other people's videos when i have already debunked those videos so yeah honestly it's not intentional that i keep picking holes in everything that billy says um it's just his videos keep popping up from different people in front of me and you know me i like to give the evidence because i can't just make up stuff so anyway let's have a listen to what he says now noah and the flood was written in the animal tablets 4,400 years before the... So as you know, I've done videos on the Emerald Tabs of the Fourth. I've read them across so many times. And I've never, ever came across anything to do with the deluge in the Emerald Tabs of Foth, uh, or the Great Flood. So I thought, let me just double check that. So I asked ChatGDP, and of course ChatGDP also says no. So um, along with all my other videos, I'm still waiting for evidence of the many things that I've asked Billy for. I know, I know it really comes across that like I'm picking on him, but I go by evidence and I can't have people telling me that they've watched Billy and that I'm wrong when I give evidence. So I just I need evidence of this. Chapter 11. Vampires, zombies, werewolves. More fiction or is there something to these? Vampires. A vampire is a mythical creature often depicted as an undead being that survives by consuming the life essence typically in the form of blood from living creatures. While folklore varies across cultures, common characteristics of vampires include a fear of sunlight, shape-shifting abilities, heightened senses, and immortality. Modern literature, film, and television often portray vampires as alluring and influential figures. The origins of the vampire date back to ancient civilizations worldwide. Accounts of blood-drinking spirits and demons emerged in ancient Mesopotamia. However, the modern understanding of vampires stems from Eastern Europe, particularly Slavic regions. Slavic folklore during the early Middle Ages introduced the concept of the undead returning from the grave to prey on the living. The term vampire originated from various languages, with the English term derived from the French vampire and influenced by the German vampire, ultimately tracing back to the Serbian term vampire, vampire. While the precise etymology remains debated, it likely has Slavic roots. The contemporary portrayal of vampires was notably shaped by literature, particularly Bram Stoker's 19th century Gothic novel Dracula. Stoker's depiction of Count Dracula, a Transylvanian noble with a thirst for blood and supernatural abilities, contributed to establishing enduring vampire characteristics in modern culture. Since then, vampires have become a prevalent theme in various media continuously evolving to match modern storytelling trends. Now let's examine this in sections. Do any creatures on Earth subsist on blood? Several Earth-dwelling creatures sustain themselves by consuming blood. Some examples include vampire bats. Most famously associated with blood consumption, these bats inhabit Latin America and feed on the blood of cattle, birds, and other animals. With their razor-sharp teeth, they create small incisions and lap up the blood with their tongues. Parasitic leeches. Certain leech species attach themselves to various animals, including humans, and feed on blood. They secrete enzymes that prevent blood clotting, allowing them to feed for extended periods. Parasitic worms. Certain parasitic worms, such as hookworms, feed on the blood of their hosts. These worms attach to the intestinal wall and consume blood, which can result in severe health issues for the host. Do any creatures fear sunlight? 
numerous creatures avoid or fear sunlight for various reasons, although they do not possess the supernatural aversion to sunlight commonly associated with vampire lore. Examples of creatures that typically avoid sunlight include nocturnal animals. Bats, owls, and certain species of rodents are nocturnal, primarily active during the night to minimize the risk of predation. Specific insects. Some insects, including moths and fireflies, are more active at night and attracted to light sources. However, many insects are active during the daytime and do not fear sunlight. Deep sea creatures. Certain fish and invertebrates living in the depths of the ocean have adapted to the darkness of their habitat and may be sensitive to sunlight or bioluminescent light. Although these creatures do not perish in sunlight, their behavior reveals their aversion to it for various reasons. Can a human survive solely on blood consumption? While humans can consume small quantities of blood as part of specific diets or rituals, it is not a sustainable or healthy source of nutrition. The human body requires a balanced diet containing carbohydrates, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals for proper functioning. Blood alone does not provide all the necessary nutrients in the required quantities for sustaining the body. Moreover, consuming blood poses significant health risks, including the potential transmission of blood-borne diseases like HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, among others. Therefore, directly consuming blood is both perilous and strongly discouraged. Some individuals consider the succubus to be the original vampire. A succubus is a demon. It could have been some type of a crap, or at least a DNA bank. Billy is talking about Noah's Ark and saying that it could be a spaceship or it could have been a boat similar to this. Now, that's like me saying there was a Jesus or there may not have been a Jesus. It's a bit of a flip-flop uh, answer when we've actually got this guy here who has actually in his possession the actual original tablet uh, from Sumerian times. And the tablet talks about how the boat was built. And there's also um, other translations of different texts, which is basically saying the same thing, that the boat has got to be made out of uh, wood and the bitumen's got to be strong. Uh, and it tells you how the, to build the boat, basically. So why Billy was talking about possibly a spaceship when we've literally got the texts that tell us, and there's no evidence that it's a spaceship, so we might as well go where the evidence is, which is a boat. Wood, wood. Chapter 12. Dowsing and Ley Lines Dowsing, also known as divining or water witching, is a centuries-old practice used to locate underground water sources, minerals, archaeological artifacts, and even lost objects. Practitioners, known as dowsers or diviners, use dowsing tools, often in the form of a Y or L-shaped rod, pendulum, or a pair of bent wires, to detect the presence of the desired target. The origins of dowsing are difficult to trace, but the practice has been documented in various cultures throughout history. Dowsing has been used by different civilizations, including ancient Egyptians and Chinese, as a method to find water sources in arid regions. The technique was widely employed in Europe during the Middle Ages and later brought to the Americas by early European settlers. The dowsing process typically involves the dowser holding the dowsing tool and walking slowly over the area where the target is believed to be located. When the dowser passes over the target, the dowsing tool is said to respond, indicating the presence of the desired object or substance. The specific reactions of the dowsing tools vary among practitioners. For instance, the rods might cross, the pendulum might swing, or the wires might move inwards or outwards. Despite its long history and widespread use, dowsing remains a controversial and pseudo-scientific practice. Many scientists and skeptics argue that the success of dowsing is purely based on chance, the ideomotor effect, unconscious muscle movements, or the dowser's familiarity with the area. Several scientific studies and experiments have been conducted to test the efficacy of dowsing with mixed and inconclusive results. Dowsing is not limited to finding water. Some practitioners claim to use it for locating minerals, archaeological sites, missing persons, or even diagnosing health issues. However, the lack of empirical evidence and the reliance on subjective experiences raise skepticism among the scientific community. Despite the skepticism, Dowsing continues to be practiced by some individuals and communities around the world, especially in rural areas where it is considered a traditional and reliable method for locating water sources. Let's look at some people who continually get paid to do dowsing, meaning they must be doing it right for people to pay over and over.
There's a website called HTTPS slash British Dowsers, org slash on its homepage. It states, are you in need of a Dowsers assistance? In line with its charitable mission, the Society maintains a register of professional Dowsers to aid anyone seeking the services of a Dowser for various purposes. This register comprises Society members who have supplied references from clients or patients or other suitable evidence, as determined by the Society's Council. These Dowsers may charge for their services, and it is advisable to discuss the fees with them before formalizing any agreements. It's essential to understand that dowsing or divining is an art rather than a science, and, like many aspects of life, it does not come with guarantees. Please be aware that all our professional dowsers are expected to adhere to our professional code of ethics, which is available for review. The website lists different people that you can contact to hire for your dowsing needs. Let's see what they say about themselves. My name is... Why the Book of Enoch is not 100% accurate. First of all, Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah. Noah was the only one of the only humans left alive after the flood, so therefore Enoch would have died, therefore Enoch wouldn't have been able to write about the flood, but yet it does in his book. Now that book was actually written in an apocalyptic language, which is only 200 uh, to 165 BCE according to here. So the book of Enoch describes the boat arc like this for Noah but of course the actual proper tablets that we've got in the British Museum describe the boat as a circular boat and tells you exactly how it was built and what wood etc so I know there's people out there that say to me ah oh, but the book of Enoch says this that, and the other technically when you break it down the book of Enoch it's just like the Bible it's well newer than the older text and therefore you can't take it 100% accurate unlike these proper texts here I'm one of the foremost world leaders in the knowledge of ancient texts, tablets, scriptures, papyrus and cylinder seals. I know it comes across very big headed. That was actually a quote from someone else, another researcher that keeps making mistakes. And I figured as soon as that researcher claims that they're one of the best and yet I keep finding errors and showing their errors with, with evidence that they're wrong. I figured, oh, hey, I must be one of the world leaders then. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about spirits, aliens, giants, uh, oh, the list just goes on, Atlantis and so on, feel free to visit my website, outrohistory.co.uk, and I go through many things that no one else has ever gone through, honestly. Trust me, you, you, when you watch them, you'll say, uh-huh, yeah, he's right. Uh, also, I actually have a Patreon page uh, where I go into long videos, uh, documentaries, which, again, no one else ever covers. And I don't actually cover in my videos. They're only on my Patreon. So lots to learn uh, here on my website. Thank you. God was so amazing that in Genesis, he actually even worried whether or not the gold of the land is good. And this was before any people were there. <laughs> so it was, why gold? Hmm. You know, why not plants, which is far more important, and water, etc. Oh, hang on, what's this? This is translations of Sumerian texts talking about the Anunnaki, Enki, etc. And, of course, they needed gold. In fact, they even had goldsmiths. Now, do you know how difficult it is to actually create uh, gold, proper gold, and mine it and ore, etc.? And it goes through, a, a, some of them even need to have an electronic current through the solution. So... For the very first people that was in uh, the planet, Adam and Eve, yeah, come on, really? Did they need gold? Was that the most important thing to make sure that God thought that that was good? Gold? Or was it the Anunnaki that needed gold, as written in tab? Chapter 13. Synchronicity and Coincidence. Synchronicity is a concept introduced by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung which refers to meaningful coincidences that cannot be explained by cause and effect, but instead are thought to be connected by some deeper underlying principle. In other words, synchronicity is the occurrence of events that are not related in a conventional cause and effect way, but have a meaningful connection or significance to the observer. Jung proposed that these meaningful coincidences occur when there is an, a causal connection between two or more events, meaning that they are not linked by a direct cause and effect relationship but are still meaningfully related. These events might be connected by shared symbols, themes, or emotional states, 
and they often carry personal significance to the individual experiencing them. Synchronistic events are seen as meaningful and significant because they often coincide with the individual's thoughts, emotions, or experiences. For example, you might be thinking about an old friend you haven't seen in years and suddenly receive a phone call or a message from that person. The coincidence of your thoughts and the external event, the phone call, creates a sense of meaningful connection, even though there is no apparent cause and effect relationship. It's important to note that synchronicity is a subjective and personal experience, and interpretations of these events can vary widely from person to person. Some people view synchronicities as signs from the universe, spiritual messages, or indications of being on the right path in life. Others may see them as random occurrences with no special significance. The concept of synchronicity remains a topic of interest and debate in the fields of psychology, philosophy, and spirituality. It's like karma, such as do something bad and something bad will happen to you. The reason why I say synchronicity is like karma is that if you believe it, then what happens to you, you'll think it's karma. For example, I don't believe in karma. If I do something bad and then later something bad happens to me, oh well, swings and roundabouts, I'd say. But if I believed in karma, then I'd say, I got what I deserved for doing something bad. If you break a mirror and believe it will give you years of bad luck, then every time something bad happens, you'll say it's because you broke the mirror. Karma is a concept that originates from ancient Indian religions and philosophies, including Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. The term karma is derived from the Sanskrit word for action or deed, and it refers to the spiritual principle of cause and effect, where the intent and actions of an individual influence their future. In the context of karma, every action, So this person said that Enoch hasn't died yet and is the oldest person ever to have lived. And I said, well, you've obviously not read the Sumerians' kings list. And then the person went away and came back and changed the subject, as they do, because obviously he hadn't done his research. And anyway, he went away again and just basically said, oh, they've been debunked, which they haven't. They're in the British Museum, these kings list. Now, the kings list show how long a king has been living for. Um, and obviously their longevity of life, because it's all to do with the Anunnaki, makes them live longer than Enoch. Now, one of the kings on the list is called Er Nama, and he built this cigarette for Nana, who was one of the Anunnaki. So if it's been debunked, then this shouldn't be here. This, this will be gone. It's vanished. Fake. But it's there. So it hasn't been debunked, because he built the freaking... Oh, this is too easy. Please don't make it too easy. Welcome to this pinned video. This is about what I do and why my research is pretty much second to none without sounding big-headed. I have to advertise myself, so forgive me if it, some stuff does sound big-headed. Uh, so you've probably come here because you may have watched some videos and thought, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. Let's see what his pinned videos are. So I'm explaining in the pin, this pinned video about what I do and how I get to the research, etc. So on my homepage of ourtruehistory.co.uk, you can scroll down and you'll see just some of the things that I'm the only person that's worked out with evidence. I always show evidence. And some of these things no one else has ever come close to. Um, you can just read it yourself and on the home page of the website. Now, if you carry on scrolling down, it says click here to watch a 34-minute documentary called The Lost Book of Our True History. Now, that video, 34 minutes, is part of a longer hours long version which i'll get to in a sec but the 34 minutes proves absolutely proves because there's tens of thousands of people that's watched it on tiktok not one person said it's wrong let alone try to give evidence uh, where my evidence is wrong so basically it proves that the bible talks about the anunnaki uh, which was an alien race that came here and genetically, genetically modified us so if you're interested 
in seeing the evidence, it's on my website, outruhistory.co.uk. Uh, so basically, if you go back up to the top, you'll see categories, video categories. Here, um, you will get to see sets of five or sets of 50. So the TikTok videos that I do, I've put in sets of five or sets of 50 on YouTube. So you can just click here and watch them direct from the website or on YouTube. So let's just say sets of 50. So here you'll have 1 to 50, 51 to 100, and so on. So there's people that have literally binge-watched them all day long and watched them off of that instead of, um, you know, scrolling through a thousand-odd videos, as you see there. I can't put my phone there. These are just genuine people that's actually said, kept me up all night. So like I say, you can watch the videos in sets of five if you just want uh, sort of a five-minute fix. If you want 50-plus minutes, then click on that one. Now, you can actually type in at the top here exactly what you're looking for. So, for example, you might be interested in mermaids, giants, ghosts, um, Jesus, for example. So I've done the video. Yes, I'm the guy that actually said who Jesus' real father was. Again, zero people's told me I'm wrong, let alone with evidence. And, of course, I show evidence. So once you're into this, uh, type in what you want. Just look for, for the video that you're after. So this one's Anunnaki. All these videos here for Anunnaki, Egypt, and so on, until you get to uh, Jesus. It's not in alphabetical order, I'm afraid. Uh, there we are, Jesus. Uh, who Jesus' real father was. There we are, it's on YouTube. So you just click there, and you can watch that video, and so on. Bigfoot, Stonehenge. So that's the uh, video set section of it. Podcasts. So when I do my live chats, I put them on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., which you can get to under Our True History. But if you don't have any of those um, podcast players, you just scroll all the way to the bottom, and I've actually made it nice and easy that you can actually just listen to it from the website. So you get to see hear all these live chats, and some of them are with guests, as you see, live debate there about international, uh, inter interdimensional beings, um, heated debate... <laughs> Uh, Atlantis, that was after I'd found where Atlantis was and again that's all on my videos like I say this is why people follow me because I do show evidence and I'm pretty much the only person that ever does this kind of research uh, so you can see there's there's a brilliant one here with RH negative guest, uh, that means this person knows pretty much everything there is to know about RH negative blood and where it came from so you will love that live chat <laughs> So they're on there, and uh, we'll just go to links, because if you're interested in books or websites that I trust, because I only go by evidence, which is you know unusual for some researchers, but I do, uh, I give where I think books or you know um, information or websites, video links to things that I think are genuine or as close as genuine as possible. So that's pretty good on there. Uh, obviously, contact me. You can do that through TikTok as well. Uh, so I have a Patreon page. Now, I do documentaries. So the documentaries that I was referring to, for example, uh, Jesus' Father and stuff, sometimes I put them on YouTube and my website. Sometimes I put them on my Patreon page. And that's because, obviously, I spend a lot of time doing the research so, for example, I'll just go through some of these now that's on my Patreon page. It's only two, uh, what, two ninety nine for a month, and there's over a hundred odd videos there, and there's an audio book or two audio books and so on. But let me just give you an example of how good these videos are. So here is part three. It's literally just been put up just now, as you see, just before I start this video. And part three is the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. So this part talks about Lilith, and I prove that Lilith did not know Adam prove that with evidence as usual and then I also in the same video go on to show where Eden was again with evidence unlike other people that just sort of guess part two of the same video so I'm going down here uh, shows that Adam and Eve was on a spaceship for the first 24 years of their life and that's with evidence as I say everything I do is with evidence and then uh, this one here is a part uh, chapter one from a new book so as I say, there's going to be three audio books on there, all for the price of two ninety nine. And I release videos every week on my Patreon page, as well as TikTok. But these ones are long documentaries, as you see the the lengths of them: fifty minutes, eleven minutes. Uh, that one's just a trailer. Uh, 
and so on. That one's 15 minutes. And this is um, part three. So there's an hour long version, in other words, uh, for this Crystal Skulls where I prove that we've been lied to by mainstream. So as you see, everything's with evidence and I prove that um, the Crystal Skulls are exactly what we believe they are, which was uh, unusually made by a wreck. Oh, well, I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, so I did a documentary on uh, which videos I think are real in terms of alien spaceships that's been filmed. Another audio book part there. There's the first part of that. Um, another audio book there. Part. See, this is why it's well worth the two pound ninety nine. Uh, Billy Meyer, I did videos proving, yes, I'm the only one that's done it, showed, now people have proved that he's wrong and lied, but I actually showed something that no one else has seen, um, which bang to rights, basically made a model, and I show that, I proved that, so as, there's no point in me making up stuff, otherwise you guys would just laugh at me, um, audiobook, there's so many videos, as I say, as well as the audiobook, um, can't remember. Oh, that one is just a link actually to uh, a really good 1970s program. Um, it's on YouTube. You can go watch that one yourself. Uh, audiobooks. Mexican aliens. I prove that the Mexican aliens, which we all know are real aliens, these are the mummified ones. Um, there's another live chat there. Um, audiobook. Another live chat. See, this is why it's well worth the money. Easter Island, I show who and when these statues were put there. Again, with evidence, unlike other people. Live chat. Uh, the list just goes on. Who Satan really was. And I mean, seriously, with, with evidence, you'll be blown away. Um, and then part two of that was the Book of Revelation. So basically, I proved that the Anunnaki were the ones talking you know, that's been copied in the Book of Revelations. In fact, I'm also the person that worked out that the trumpet in the ancient text actually means missile or rocket. I've, I'm I'm pretty much the first to come out with many things, and once you reread things, you'll see. And, of course, I show the evidence, so um, I'm just trying to go through this as quick as, quick as possible. Uh, like I say, long documentaries here, as well as the audio books. Uh, dinosaurs live with humans. I show evidence of that. Obviously, we know that they didn't all die out 65 million years ago. Uh, I debate with AI, and obviously I win because it lies. Who Jesus' real father is is here as well. It's on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, the Lost Book of Our True History, that's that one I was telling you about that uh, is on my website, Stroke YouTube, for 34 minutes, but the longer version, look at this, 31 minutes, 37 minutes, uh, 12 minutes, 18 minutes. It's long, hours long uh, of that showing evidence. And the list just goes on and on. As you see, I'm running out of time now. But the list, what Sumerian stuff means, it's, it's a wealth of information all backed up by evidence. So that's on my patreon.com, Our True History. So hopefully I see you on my website or TikTok or on Patreon. Thank you. Enoch is actually thought but in the Sumerian tablet, Ningus Zida. Where do all these people come from that don't actually do any research? Enoch was not a god. Ningus Zida was. Ningus Zida stroke Thoth built the, the pyramids, whereas Enoch was taken around by messengers of gods if you actually did bother doing any research. I don't know, I just give up. Chapter 14, Hypnosis. I'll mainly talk about hypno-regression compared to hypnosis, but here's a brief overview of hypnosis. Hypnosis is a trance-like state of focused attention, heightened suggestibility, and deep relaxation, often induced by a hypnotist's guidance. During hypnosis, individuals may be more open to suggestions and can experience changes in perception, memory, and behavior. While in this state, people are not asleep or unconscious, but are deeply relaxed and highly focused on the hypnotist's instructions. Hypnosis has been used for various purposes, including pain management, stress reduction, overcoming phobias, and improving self-confidence. It is often employed as a therapeutic technique known as hypnotherapy, where a trained therapist uses hypnosis to help individuals address specific issues or achieve specific goals. The effectiveness of hypnosis varies from person to person, and not everyone is equally susceptible to hypnotic suggestions. 
Hypnosis is generally considered safe when practiced by trained professionals, and it is essential for individuals to approach it with an open mind and willingness to cooperate for it to be successful. Hypnosis is sometimes used as a therapeutic technique to explore past lives and alleged alien encounters. These applications of hypnosis fall into the realm of regression therapy, where individuals are guided into a relaxed state and encouraged to recall memories or experiences from their past, whether in this lifetime or in previous lives. It's important to note that these practices are controversial and not supported by scientific evidence. Here's an explanation of how hypnosis is used in these contexts. Hypnosis for past lives. Some people believe in reincarnation, the idea that a soul is reborn into different bodies across multiple lifetimes. Hypnotherapy for past lives aims to help individuals access memories from previous incarnations. During a hypnosis session, a trained therapist guides the person back in time, encouraging them to Proof that angels were just messengers and not ethereal beings. This is the Book of Enoch. Now you could say, well, the Book of Enoch's no good and rubbish, but then I could say that about any religious text. So you can't pick and choose what you want to read. So then Raphael, who was a holy angel, there you go, who was with me, answered me and said, this is the tree of wisdom. Uh, so he's basically telling Enoch that this is a tree of wisdom, which uh, thy father of old and the aged mother who were there before, had eaten and learnt the wisdom and their eyes opened and blah, blah, blah. Adam and Eve, obviously. Raphael's parents were Adam and Eve. So no, stop with this angel baloney. Uh, we've got evidence that messengers, because the Anunnak, the word messenger is angel in Hebrew. So it's a messenger. And we've got the original ancient Sumerian text with the word messenger all over where they're doing the same thing that Raphael does. Enough now. 188 centimeters. His extraordinary growth persisted throughout his teenage years, reaching 7 feet 4 inches, 224 centimeters, at 13 years old. In his late teens, he exceeded 8 feet, 244 centimeters, in height. During his final measurement on June 27, 1940, he measured 8 feet 11 inches, 272 centimeters, tall. Tragically, he passed away at the age of 22 on July 15, 1940, due to a septic leg brace infection, a complication arising from the leg braces necessary to support his immense height. Gigantism, a rare condition caused by an overactive pituitary gland, was the reason behind Robert Wadlow's remarkable height. It's worth noting that ancient giants, too, might not have lived to old age. Giants back then could have had a similar lifespan, such as reaching the age of 22, although they would still have been considered giants. Distinguishing between the Anunnaki and other giants, like those found in stories such as Jack and the Beanstalk, is crucial. Both groups are exceptionally tall, but the ancient narratives provide specific characteristics to identify the Anunnaki, also known as Sumerian, Greek, Egyptian, Roman, and Indian gods. In Greek mythology, the Titans were a race of powerful deities, overthrown by the Olympian gods in a divine war called the Titanomachy. Some Titans, like Atlas, were described as gigantic. The Titans were believed to be offspring of primordial deities, Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth. This lineage implies a connection to the Anunnaki and the Homo sapiens they created, reinforcing the idea that some of these offspring might have exhibited gigantism, as previously mentioned. The Titans were a powerful race of deities that predates the Olympian gods in Greek mythology. They were overthrown by the Olympians in a significant cosmic conflict known as the Titanomachy. Following the Titans' defeat, Zeus and the Olympian gods emerged as the dominant deities in the Greek pantheon. Note, in this context, Zeus corresponds to Enlil, and Enki corresponds to Poseidon. In Norse mythology, giants known as Jotnar, or Frost Giants, frequently clashed with the gods particularly Thor. One notable giant in Norse mythology is Ymir, the first being and progenitor of all giants. Note, Thor corresponds to Marduk, the son of Enki. The origin of the Jotnar in Norse mythology is not clearly defined, leaving open the- Scientists say they now know what our oldest ancestor looked like, and it's something ever-
This news program is saying that because they found a skeleton, they believe that the ancestors of the United Kingdom were dark skinned. Now, we do have evidence that the uh, ancient Africans were the ones that first left Africa and then spread around. However, we've also got evidence that 100,000 years ago, the Anunnaki bred with humans, RH negative blood, in the Middle East, in which case we then got white skinned people, or pale skinned, olive skinned Europeans. So we have 90,000 years between that time and when this news report saying that the first Britons or <laughs> United Kingdom people came here. So by finding one skeleton doesn't mean that they were all that particular colour. So they really do need to do a little bit more research instead of just finding one thing and saying that's it, everything therefore is correct. So don't trust mainstream until you get up at One telltale sign of a fake is if the alleged mermaid is depicted wearing a bra or something resembling a chest covering. In the original stories and depictions, merpeople are typically depicted as naked, wearing at most a hat or wristband. Even television networks have contributed to the confusion. Animal Planet aired two pseudo-documentaries, The Body Found and The New Evidence, which purported to present scientific evidence of mermaid existence. However, these programs feature actors posing as scientists, a fact disclosed briefly during the closing credits. Despite this disclaimer, Discussions on social media platforms like Twitter under the hashtag hash mermaids indicated that a substantial number of viewers remained unaware of the fictional nature of the shows. For instance, tweets like, Having seen the documentary Mermaids the Body Found, I am now convinced that mermaids exist. And considering that 90% of the ocean remains unexplored, are you seriously suggesting that mermaids are non-existent? retweeted over 800 times, reveal the impact of these pseudo-documentaries. It is crucial to remember that these documentaries were broadcast on a network claiming to educate its audience about the natural world. The Body Found faced rightful criticism as the decaying remains of science television, making the airing of a sequel on Animal Planet a surprising and disappointing development. There could be over 2,000 ancient carvings and statues depicting mermaids or merpeople worldwide, given the diverse cultures and historical periods in which these representations exist. However, determining an exact number remains challenging due to the lack of comprehensive documentation and cataloging of artifacts from various regions and time periods, as previously mentioned. But does this mean we have no evidence, no mermaids washed up on the shores? Well, maybe we do. Recent discoveries have shed light on a centuries-old mummified mermaid, a bizarre Lilith, the person that got spurned by Adam before Eve was created. What a load of... Now, I've actually done my research. So, unlike these people here, Wikipedia showing a picture of Ishtar struck in Anna and calling it Lilith. How silly is that? And the same as this one here. They have no idea. However, I do because I have done the research. In fact, I've also done the research there on my Patreon page uh, for many, many different things. And I'm always right let's be honest uh so with regards lilith she was not the one that adam spurned because in my part three that will be out at the beginning of the year on my patreon page i prove that adam had no knowledge of lilith before eve and i prove that eve was part of the beginning of adamu which is not adam or or adipa so it's up to you, believe silly people that make up stuff, or me. Noah from the Flood Story, also known as Atrahasis Utnapishtim. The Flood Story, C1. 7.4 segment A approx. 36 lines missing. 1, 10, sets up. I will. The perishing of my mankind. For Nimna, I will stop the annihilation of my creatures, and I will return the people from their dwelling grounds. Let them build many cities so that I can refresh myself in their shade. Let them lay the bricks of many cities in pure places. Let them establish places of divination in pure places. And when the fire quenching is arranged, the divine rites and exalted powers are perfected and the earth is irrigated, I will establish well-being there. 10.14.
After An, Enlil, Enki, and Nimna had fashioned the black-headed people, they also made animals multiply everywhere and made herds of four-legged animals exist on the plains, as is befitting. Aprox, 32 lines missing. Segment B1, 27. Seat in heaven. Flood. Mankind. So he made, then Nimnu. Holy Inanna made a lament for its people. Enki took counsel with himself. An, Enlil, Enki, and Nimna made all the gods of heaven and earth take an oath by invoking An and Enlil. In those days, Zi-Udsura the king, the Gudug priest, he fashioned the humble, committed, reverent, day by day, standing constantly at something that was not a dream appeared, conversation, taking an oath by invoking heaven and earth. In the Kyur, the gods, a wall. Zi-Udsura, standing at its side, heard, Sidewall standing at my left side. Sidewall. I will speak words to you. Take heed of my words. Pay attention to my instructions. A flood will sweep over the... In all the... A decision that the seed of mankind is to be destroyed has been made. The verdict, the word of the divine assembly, cannot be revoked. The order announced by Anne and Enlil cannot be overturned. Their kingship, their term has been cut off. Their heart should be rested about this. Now. What? Aprox. Thirty-eight lines missing. Segment D1. Eleven. All the windstorms and gales arose together, and the flood swept over the... After the flood had swept over the land, and waves and windstorms had rocked the huge boat for seven days and seven nights, Utu the sun god came out, illuminating heaven and earth. Ziudsura could drill an opening in the huge boat, and the hero... Just keep trusting mainstream science and ignore people like me, but <laughs> they get it right. Here in live science, it says the outer core of the earth is liquid, but the inner core is solid. Here in National Geographic, it's saying that the inner core is mostly solid. You get where I'm going with this. Here, the Chinese Academy of Science is saying the inner core is not normal solid, but it's composed of lattice and liquid. So here, it even says that they've now found an innermost inner core. <laughs> So they have no idea. And the reason why I'm going through this is here they're saying that in Ju uh, Jupiter's uh, core is made of solid ice. Now, why can't Earth's core have been ice? Because here it says that over a billion years ago, Earth suddenly grew in size. And they're saying it's because uh, the molten liquid inside the center of the core, one minute it's solid, now it's liquid, um, crystallized due to lowering temperatures. But what happens if it was ice and the ice got hot steam. Some experts speculate that the Menahuni legend might be rooted in reality. A breakthrough came in 2003 when a dwarf human species, Homo floresiensis, was found on the Indonesian island of Flores. Standing at approximately one meter in height and walking upright, this species displayed human-like teeth, a receding forehead, and lacked a chin. Fossils of Homo floresiensis, dating back 38,000 to 18,000 years, have been unearthed. But archaeological findings suggest it inhabited Flores between 95,000 and 13,000 years ago. This species utilized stone tools and fire, hunting pygmy elephants, Komodo dragons, and giant rats native to Flores. Researchers believe H. floresiensis represents a dwarfed variation of Homo erectus. Island environments often lead to the evolution of dwarfed forms in larger mammals. Modern humans arrived on Flores between 55,000 and 35,000 years ago, likely coexisting with H. floresiensis during their time on the island. Yes, this person said that my information is wrong, and then I asked for evidence where my evidence is wrong, and this person is basically saying that the original tablets that I go by have been manipulated. So I'm asking this person, could you show me the evidence that these two million Sumerian tablets, let alone Babylonian, Assyrian, Akkadian tablets, uh, have been manipulated? So you've also then got to say that the temples that they built uh, have been manipulated as well. And then you've got to say that these cylinder seals, and this is all prior to the Bible, which is why this person's got upset, because this person on one of my posts said that uh, I'm well off, in, in other words, wrong. Um, so that's when I asked for the evidence to prove my evidence wrong. And of course, this person didn't even know about these ancient texts. Otherwise, they wouldn't have said that they've all been manipulated. So anyway, to this person, please show evidence where all of these have been manipulated. I'll wait. Serious star system. Some came from the Pleiades. Some came from Aldebaran. Some came from... 
This clip is from a video that Billy Carson's done saying that in the British Museum there is the Enuma Elish, which talks about the planet Nibiru and the Anunnaki. And then he proceeds to say that the Anunnaki seem to have come from all those different locations that you saw in the beginning of the clip. Now, I haven't come across any evidence of that whatsoever. So I'm just wondering if anyone's got any evidence of it or whether it's just sort of something that Billy's thought might be the case as opposed to actual evidence. So if anyone's got any evidence that the Anunnaki said whatsoever that they come from anywhere else other than Nibiru, uh, please let me know. Thank you. God gave us his name in DNA, our DNA, which spells that. Now, interestingly, obviously, we all know that Enlil was the God of Israel who had a lapis lazuli throne, same as the Almighty Being needed a lapis lazuli throne and sat down 22 times in the Bible. But obviously Jehovah was Enki, which was Enlil's half-brother, uh, both princes. We've got the evidence of all of that. Uh, but what's more interesting is obviously Enki did create us in his image, which we know we've got the actual original text that predate the Bible, not Enlil, which would have been Yahweh. So Jehovah created us. Anyway, what's more interesting is I, I've kind of identified as a god for a very long time. It's, honestly, I have. Um, and look... This is the formation of the DNA codes, and my name is Adrian Timothy Carter Grant. So Enki knew about me way before, so thank you, that's amazing. So this person's asked in that if there's no such thing as God, how come everything seems perfect? Now I did do a video way back, video number probably 50 or something, and basically what I said is, imagine a pool table, and you whack the balls on a pool table, and they're smashing into everything, some flying off into pockets. So it's chaos. Over time, the balls settle. So what you're left with is what works. Now, speed that up. If the balls are just still moving ever so slowly, speed that up You know, a million years or billion years. And eventually those balls will bash into each other again. So right now, everything is fine as it is for what we are and how life evolved. But you run our universe on another few billion years and another solar system is going to come in and take ours out. So it's not going to be perfect. So therefore, God got it wrong, if you see my point. So basically, as it is, is as it is. This video is for people that think I talk rubbish. So on video number 1236, 1236, I show Ivan Finkel talking about the Anunnaki going up into heaven and coming back down, etc. And I do get a lot of people, such as this commenter here, who basically put a silly face or something, as if to say I'm rubbish. So I, as always, go watch, that's why I gave you the, the video number, 1236. Go watch and read all the comments. And you'll come across people like this person here that just sort of says, you know, BS or puts a little funny face and things like that. And me polite, I say, would you like to see the evidence? And I even paste the uh, link to the evidence. And of course, this is the comments. You'll just go read all the different people. They all refuse, refuse to look at the evidence. So when people think that I'm talking rubbish, just think for a second. I've got the evidence and they refuse. I'm super excited to tell you about my brand new documentary. It's 20 minutes long nearly, and it's called Yowie Connection to Bigfoot? Question mark. So I've been researching Bigfoot for decades and I needed finally to work out whether or not there is a connection between the Australian Yowie and the sort of North American Bigfoot and I have think I've worked out one way or another I'm not going to spoil it for you uh, whether there is or isn't but it's on my Patreon page if you're interested along with many many other documentaries in fact over a hundred odd documentaries long ones uh, this is the one where we prove that Lilith had no knowledge whatsoever of Adam and Eve. This one is the one where I prove that Adam and Eve was on a spaceship for 24 years, the beginning of their life, with evidence, always with evidence, and so on and so on. So many, many documentaries on my... And it's only a couple of pounds for a month. So it's Our True History presents You don't have your own soul. I'll show you why. But first let's pretend you are born with your own soul. Let's say these are the very first people on the planet. Let's say they were born with their own soul or spirit, or whatever you want to call it. They have a child that also has their own soul when they are born. Then the father dies, 
While the mother is pregnant, his soul will reincarnate into someone else, but if the next child has their own soul, what happens to the dad's soul, unless the dad's soul had joined or pushed out the new child's soul, then the new child would either have two souls, his and his dad's or the dad's soul took the place of the boy's soul and now the boy has his dad's soul, which is not his own soul. If you research and talk to mediums and clairvoyants, they will tell you we only have one soul. This leaves there is no reincarnation, but wait, Virginia University has done over 2,500 cases, from those 1,200 up, those cases prove reincarnation is real. So where does that leave us? The soul is its own entity, in the emerald tablets of Thoth is shows there is an internal being, light energy orb, that joins with us, three to four months in the mother's womb and connects to the pineal gland, dot it's like a hard drive. It is there to learn, when you die, you have control of it for a while, but at some point the entity takes over and goes back round into another person. The entity is nothing to do with God. It is just a light energy being and we are containers for them while we are alive. If you want to see more on this please visit my website, ourtruehistory.co.uk. Thank you. I was just watching this live with this gentleman and he said that Jesus will judge you when you die and then you kind of do your own judgment. So I wrote this most obvious question. What about the 298,000 years of people that died before Jesus was born? Do they get judgment? Obviously, those poor souls, 298,000 years, we're talking a few billion people. Uh, obviously, he just didn't read my question out. And that's really sad because when I do my lives, I read every single question, out, even if it's a hate one. So straight away, my spider senses on him avoid from my point of view because I will never not read anyone's question out regardless i will answer it and if i don't know the answer i'll say i don't know the answer i don't avoid questions so that's my first problem and the second problem is seriously what about the two hundred ninety-eight thousand years of people that had no jesus to judge them where are they so feel free to follow me i won't lie to you guys did you know we have the original tablets and texts that the Bible copied from? I am going through this because so many people have no idea that we actually have alien texts that talk about the aliens that did the things that the Bible copied from. So, for example, Enki and Anarchy telling Noah to build the ark. That's in the British Museum. The Ten Plagues of Egypt. However, I'm the only person to work out that the tablets actually happened. The events in Israel and the aftermath happened in Egypt. Got the evidence for that. Enki being told by the Anarchy Assembly to create a great flood. The Anarchy looking down as a great flood happens all these texts are real the book of revelations where the anunnaki used weapons of terror i'm the only one that worked this out but i've got the evidence we have the text where enki and nimna created the very first homo sapiens yes it's starting to sound we have the text where enki says the seventh day will be a day of rest there's so much more uh, and i won't lie to you i give you all the evidence whenever i do videos i give the evidence so it's up to you guys uh if you're interested in learning more feel free to follow Oh, God help me. Why do people... <laughs> Where's logic gone in this world? So, New International Version, 1974. Who thinks in their right mind that 1974 people knew more than the ancient people that actually originally wrote the texts? And I'll just prove this right now. How stupid it is for people to even believe the 1974 version. That, so, Genesis, in the New International Version, in the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Created. Okay, no mistake there. Now you go Young's literal translation. This is direct from the Hebrew, so no one's messed around with it. In the beginning of God's preparing the heavens and earth. And that's because we actually have the tablets where Enki was cataloging things for the first six days on earth when he first arrived. Preparing, and it goes on here about separating the waters under the heavens to be collected, which is rainwater under space which is space heaven so who in their right mind well i i won't answer that i kind of know who in their right mind believes this and not this but then we've got older texts that actually predate all of this that i get cold you know crazy when i point out exactly the older text that this copied from this is young's literal translation copied from the older texts so one of them's right and the rest is just you know, copy of a copy of a copy and then changed many a time, by the way. So I don't know, it's up to you guys. Follow me, learn our real history or just, you know,
go along with the flow and pretend, you, pretend that's correct. I don't know. I give up. This lady talks about the Anunnaki, and I kind of have an idea of which researcher she sort of takes the information from because it's actually not right. So let's have a listen to what she says here, and we'll go through where the problems are. They tweaked our DNA so that we would not use full potential of our brain. So basically she's saying here that the Anunnaki tweaked human or homo sapien DNA. Unfortunately, there was no homo sapien. That's where the missing link comes in. So basically we've got evidence that, uh, including dark-skinned people, we have Neanderthal DNA in us, which means it was the Anunnaki's essence and the uh, Neanderthal DNA that created the Homo sapien. So she then says basically that they fused the chromosomes to make us less smart. Have a listen. Why? Because if not, we'd be like Doctor Strange, masters of quantum physics. We would... So she's saying that because they genetically modified chromosomes, number 23 and number 24, to make us less smart. However, this is the actual text that she's probably not even bothered reading. Uh, so this is the actual text from the translations of the ancient tablets. This is uh, Enki talking to his mother. mother. My mother, the creature you planned, creature that's us homo sapiens, that will be once they've done it, you planned will really come into existence. Impose on him the work of carrying the baskets. That's because they needed us to carry baskets for, yes, you guessed it, the gold that they were mining. Now, why make someone dumb to carry baskets when you already had someone dumb in the first place? So you didn't need to do anything. So in other words, if the if the homo sapien, obviously there was no homo sapien, but let's pretend this woman's right. The creature was smart enough already, they had to dumb it down to get this new creature to be able to carry a basket when the obviously the modern the, the one that's already there would have so you see my point unfortunately I've, I've seen a lot of this woman's videos and uh yeah yeah followers of the law of attraction believe that synchronicities occur when an individual's thoughts and energy vibrations align with corresponding events in the external world positive or negative thinking is thought to attract similar experiences leading to synchronistic occurrences. Skeptics often explain synchronicity as mere coincidences, suggesting that people tend to notice patterns and connections in random events due to cognitive biases. According to this perspective, synchronistic events are the result of chance and selective attention. Some interpretations of parallel universes propose that synchronicity could be a result of events aligning across different realities or dimensions. In one universe, an event might occur and in another a related but seemingly coincidental event aligns, creating a sense of synchronicity. Jungian theory also suggests that synchronicity might arise from the collective unconscious, a shared reservoir of experiences and symbols that all humans inherit. Events and symbols that resonate with the collective unconscious might manifest as synchronicities, reflecting universal archetypes and themes. These are great reasons why it can't be a coincidence, but for every good reason, there are reasons against it. Let's look at some reasons why synchronicity should be just a coincidence. Coincidences are events that happen by random chance. In a world with billions of people and countless daily events, statistically improbable events are likely to occur occasionally without any meaningful connection. People tend to notice and remember events that stand out to them, especially if those events seem to align with their thoughts, emotions, or desires. This selective attention can make a random event appear meaningful when, in reality, it is just one of many random occurrences. The interpretation of events as synchronistic is highly subjective and varies from person to person. What one person sees as a meaningful coincidence, another might view as a simple accident or chance occurrence. Humans are wired to recognize patterns in their environment. This ability sometimes leads people to perceive connections between unrelated events attributing meaning to coincidences that might not have any inherent significance. Coincidences lack a discernible cause and effect relationship. Unlike synchronicity, there is no underlying principle or guiding force that connects the events. They are isolated, unrelated incidents that happen to coincide in time or circumstance. 
Coincidences cannot be reliably predicted or anticipated. Synchronistic events, on the other hand, are often perceived as having a sense of purpose or intentionality, which sets them apart from random coincidences. We don't seem to have anything concrete to say one way or another. There has to be a way to narrow this down. The law of averages is a statistical principle that suggests the outcome of a random event will converge toward the expected or average outcome as more trials or events occur. In the context of synchronistic events, the law of averages implies that in a world with billions of people and numerous daily events, some events may seem meaningful or synchronistic purely by chance, without any underlying purpose or connection. If synchronicity is real, then is Murphy's Law real? Why can't that be real? When you look at what it is, you'll agree that if one is real, then there's no reason the other shouldn't be real. Sod's Law, also known as Murphy's Law, refers to the adage that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. It is a humorous and cynical expression used to describe the tendency for things to go awry at the worst possible moment. The phrase implies a sense of inevitability about unfortunate events or mishaps occurring, especially when they are least desired. The origins of the term are uncertain, but Murphy's Law is often attributed I am a little annoyed. So I did a video where I was showing this lady was in error and I kind of had a feeling she may have copied from someone else that makes the same mistake on that particular part of history. And this person basically said to me that I should be watching and learning from Billy Carson, bearing in mind he's the researcher that I think this woman <laughs> copies from. And obviously, as you guys know, I've unfortunately, occasionally I have to just do videos to prove that Billy's got things wrong. Uh, I don't like doing it, but now, because of this person saying that I should go and watch Billy, I think the gloves are off now, so every time now I see someone where, because I always show evidence, you know I show evidence, the other researchers don't, they just, you know, talk in heads, whereas I show the evidence, so from now on, if I come across anyone that's got errors, errors in their research, and I've got the evidence to prove them wrong, I will now do videos, so you're going to see a lot more other people, I'm afraid, being shown the errors of their way. There was a war that went on, disagreements happened, the golden age began to fall, and these beings, these advanced beings, started going to war against each other for control and domination of humans and resources on this planet and other planets as well in our solar system, one of them being the moon and Mars, and they actually had a battle. So this battle is also well recorded in Sumerian tablets tales. Okay, I would love, love love to see these tablets that talk about the war on mars and the moon i've not seen them hey guys i found some amazing research flat earth and a dome and a simulation is all real so i'm showing you this picture here because when uh, other researchers like for example this guy this guy's just ai computer generated but i'm using him as an example when they show and tell you about these amazing discoveries they show you pictures like this and so yes there is a flat earth and a dome over our earth now i'm not going to show you evidence like i normally show in pretty much all my other videos the reason why i'm not showing you evidence is because when you listen to people that tell you when they don't show you evidence most people seem to now believe those people as opposed to me when I show the evidence because I get people telling me that I should go and listen to the other people that don't show evidence, whereas all my, literally all my videos show evidence when I'm talking about something. So now I'm just going to say, yeah, we're in a simulation, we're in this, we'll make up some crap because I can do this and you'll all believe me because I'm not showing evidence. Mainstream archaeologists have messed up once again. So here's an article, Ancient Greek Civilization Rewritten by a Quarter of a Million Years. That's 250,000 years. That's a lot of long time. So the reason why I'm showing this is because they didn't realise that uh, people could use tools back then, 250,000 years further back than what they peer-reviewed first thought. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because I get people saying to me that my research, which actually doesn't make any mistakes, uh, my research should be peer-reviewed. If it's not, therefore, it's going to be wrong. And I'm just pointing out once again that your little mainstream with the, pe the same peer-reviewed people still make mistakes. So it's probably easier to follow me and get the real information than it is mainstream, as I keep saying on all my videos.
statements made by a child recalling a past life can vary widely. Dr. Jim Tucker, interviewing a young child. Possible statements a child might make. You're not my mommy, daddy. I have another mommy, daddy. When I was big, I used to have blue eyes, had a car, etc. That happened before I was in mommy's tummy. I have a wife slash husband slash children. I used to drive a truck, live in another town, etc. I died in a car accident slash after I fell, etc. Remember when I lived in that other house was your daddy, etc.? Once the university gets involved, they study the child and conclude if the child is recalling a past life. These cases typically involve children spontaneously recalling detailed and specific information about a life they purportedly lived before their current one. Here are a few examples of the cases studied by the University of Virginia. James Leininger. One of the most well-known cases involves James Leininger, a young boy who claimed to remember being a World War II pilot. He provided specific details about his previous life, including the name of his aircraft carrier, the names of his fellow pilots, and the location of his death. Researchers were able to corroborate many of his statements with historical records. Ryan Hammonds. Ryan started having nightmares about a Hollywood actor's life and death when he was four years old. He claimed to have been an actor named Marty Martin, who died in 1964. Ryan's statements about the actor's life were remarkably accurate, and he was able to recognize people and places from Marty Martin's life. Chase Bowman. Chase began recalling memories of being a soldier in the Civil War. He provided specific details about battles, units, and names, which were later found to match the experiences of a soldier named John Gordon. Hypnosis cases cover alien abductions. The most famous is the story of Betty and Barney Hill. In 1961, Betty and Barney Hill, an interracial couple, claimed to have been abducted by extraterrestrial beings while driving through the White Mountains of New Hampshire. They reported seeing a bright light in the sky that seemed to follow their car. Later, they experienced a period of missing time and could not account for a significant portion of their journey. Upon returning home, they began to experience disturbing dreams and emotional distress. Seeking answers, they underwent hypnosis separately with different therapists. During these sessions, both Betty and Barney independently recalled being taken aboard a UFO by non-human entities. They described medical examinations, communication through telepathy, and being shown a three-dimensional star map. Under hypnosis, Betty drew a map shown to her by the aliens, which she claimed represented a star system. Later, a schoolteacher and amateur astronomer named Marjorie Fish attempted to match the map to known star patterns. She identified a configuration that seemed to match Betty's description, a group of stars in the Zeta Reticuli star system. The Hills account gained widespread attention and is often cited in discussions of alien abductions and UFO encounters. While skeptics have proposed various explanations, including sleep disorders and false memories, there are too many coincidences that suggest they did have something happen. It's funny how when mainstream wants hypnosis to work, they will claim the hypnosis worked. But when it's subjects they don't want us to know about, they claim the hypnosis might be false memories or other excuses. One notable example is the case of the serial killer Ted Bundy. Investigators used hypnosis to help witnesses recall details about Bundy's appearance and activities, which contributed to his identification and eventual capture. Let's look at the Harvard Gazette paper on a story of someone hypnotized after an alien abduction. Mark H. claims he was abducted by extraterrestrial beings. According to his account, he vividly recalled It's time for the Nephilim to return. The time has come. They will invade your... The lady was just saying the giant Nephilim will return, but here in the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees, it's basically saying that the Anunnaki tried to wipe them out. And when I say Anunnaki, we actually have proof. Here's ancient texts here talking about, this is just one of many, uh, that predate the Bible, literally saying that they're going to create an, a flood, and then a bit later on they're going to tell Zuzudra, which was Noah, to build an ark, blah, blah, blah. So we've got... Nephilim returning according to that lady, but that means Jesus coming back isn't such a miracle then if the Nephilim return back from dying after being in a flood. But ah, oh, that's okay because Superman and Batman obviously returns as well. But we do actually have all the evidence we need in this video here. So if anyone's interested in it, go to YouTube and type in proof Anunnaki were here and that will answer everything you ever need to know.
There's a lot of videos going around similar to this which show sort of dinosaurs or giants or things like that. And this is just literally computer generated. This one's done by Runway AI. And as you'll see, you can literally type in what you want, whether it's black and white, color, dinosaur, not dinosaur, and it gives you a four second slow-mo video, which gives you the idea that it's fake. So if you ever see, obviously they're also fake, but yeah. So don't fall for it and share and like all that with these other videos. No point. And after many years, two old guys in their 80s revealed that they were the one. What a load of rubbish. So here is a carving in wood that was then talked about in a paper back in 1678. So unless Doug and Dave had time travel machines... Uh, they didn't do all of the crop circles. Now, if you actually look at Dr. Levengood's research, uh, he shows with evidence that the crop nodes are superheated. In other words, the knuckle part of a crop is superheated from the inside with a microwave. It doesn't mean someone goes out with a microwave. It means whatever the phenomenon is, it superheats it and it bends the node as opposed to a plank of wood, which flattens from the bottom. But of course, let's not have evidence ruin a good fake story like that person was saying at the beginning and of course there was crop circles all over the world as well prior to Doug and Dave uh, and some simultaneous at the same time so well done Doug and Dave your geniuses in time travel the Anunnaki created us humans now what's mainstream going to do about that that everyone's working this out well they're going to say Neanderthals and homo humans now belong to the same species which gets away with this whole missing link because obviously we've got fused chromosomes number 23 and 24 and that was done in a laboratory by the Anunnaki but of course there's always this missing link so now if they say that they're together then they get rid of the missing link however this is homo sapien the first one this is homo sapien sapien modern human now we know that these were both correct because uh, here in the ancient text exactly where and when they say that they created man uh, the whole list just goes on it talks about getting making the the gods use us to free them from their toil by carrying baskets etc so we've got evidence that they created us so of course then later on the anunnaki bred with those humans to create the first homo sapiens sapiens and that is when Adipa and Titi, Adam and Eve, came along and he possessed... ...multiple alien races out there. We shouldn't be literally tripping over it. This video is talking about the Fermi Paradox, which basically says that there should be millions of aliens and we should be all tripping over each other by now. That's the assumption from these people that's on this video. The problem with that is we do have aliens. We've been seeing aliens for a very long time. Millions of people as have actually been abducted and got scoop marks and implants and missing time and regression and everything else. So we do actually have the aliens. Now, what if they don't want to be seen? Just because we might be tripping over ourselves, if they avoid being seen, then what? Then what do we do? So this is why people like this really annoy me because they just see it from one logical point of view, but they don't actually really see it properly. So obviously, if they don't want to be seen, then they won't be seen. So it doesn't mean they're not there. According to the Bible, the Earth is only around 6,000 years old. This gentleman asks another gentleman if that's true, and the guy goes, yes, it's more than likely true, because and then he starts quoting things from the Bible. problem with that is we've got things like the King's List, which show thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of um, kings reigning. We've also got the Melusifer tree that's over 5,000 years old and apparently there's one over 6,000 years old in Indonesia. Then we've got the Sumerian tablets that talk about shards at 3,600 and there's lots of them uh, which goes over the 6,000 years. Then we've got the weathering on the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids which show at least 10,000 BC, 12,000 BCE. And then we've got the fact that the Bible actually copied the older texts anyway and got things wrong. We've I've proved that a zillion times. Our true history presents. You don't have your own soul. I'll show you why, but first let's pretend you are born with your own soul. Let's say these are the very first people on the planet. Let's say they were born with their own soul or spirit, or whatever you want to call it. They have a child that also has their own soul when they are born. Then the father dies, while the mother is pregnant, his soul will reincarnate into someone else, but if the next child has their own soul, what happens to the dad's soul, unless the dad's soul had joined or pushed out the new child's soul, then the new child would either have two souls, 
his and his dad's or the dad's soul took the place of the boy's soul and now the boy has his dad's soul, which is not his own soul. If you research and talk to mediums and clairvoyants, they will tell you we only have one soul. This leaves there is no reincarnation, but wait, Virginia University has done over 2,500 cases, from those 1,200 up, those cases prove reincarnation is real. So where does that leave us? The soul is its own entity, in the emerald tablets of Thoth is shows there is an internal being, light energy orb, that joins with us, three to four months in the mother's womb and connects to the pineal gland, dot it's like a hard drive. It is there to learn, when you die, you have control of it for a while, but at some point the entity takes over and goes back round into another person. The entity is nothing to do with God. It is just a light energy being and we are containers for them while we are alive. If you want to see more on this please visit my website. OurTrueHistory.co.uk Thank you. The Bible tells us that God created a perfect world. There was no death, no disease. Actually, if you go by Young's literal translation instead of the other copies of copies that people changed over and over, always go to Young's literal translation. You'll find that in Genesis 1, it's the God, God's plural prepared the heavens and earth because they were cataloging, the Anunnaki were cataloging things for the first six days. And then we've got this cuneiform siphon that says that Enki tells the other Anunnaki that the seventh day will now be a day of rest. But let's go back to where this person said God created because he's he's using the, the, the Bibles that are man-made and changed. Go back to Young's literal translation, plural and prepared. Didn't say created, so if you're going to do it properly, do it properly. I'm super excited to tell you about my brand new documentary. It's 20 minutes long nearly, and it's called Yowie Connection to Bigfoot? Question mark. So I've been researching Bigfoot for decades, and I needed finally to work out whether or not there is a connection between the Australian Yowie and the sort of North American Bigfoot. And I have, think I've worked out one way or another. I'm not going to spoil it for you. Uh, whether there is or isn't but it's on my patreon page if you're interested along with many many other documentaries in fact over a hundred odd documentaries long ones uh, this is the one where we prove that Lilith had no knowledge whatsoever of Adam and Eve this one is the one where I prove that Adam and Eve was on a spaceship for 24 years at the beginning of their life with evidence, always with evidence, and so on and so on. So many, many documentaries on my... And it's only a couple of pounds for a month. So it's... I'm doing this video so that if I send you to this video, it means that you've said something that you can't back up or you've told me that I'm wrong. So I'm just going to go through these ones up where other people have said things. So here, one person says reptilians are fallen angels, and I wrote, could you show me the evidence? And you can read it yourself. They didn't bother showing me the evidence, obviously. Another one here is a great lie, deception at end times, uh, not God's demons. Basically, I said, I, I'm happy to show you the evidence. Can you show me what the evidence of demons are? You can read these. He doesn't. Uh, another one here, no, they didn't. God did. And, of course, I said, would you like to see the evidence? And then try and debunk my evidence with evidence. Uh, but, of course, you know, you can read. <laughs> they don't bother. So the whole point is whatever you've just said and I've pointed you to this video you can't beat me without sounding big headed it's, it's just only because I go by evidence old rascals it means that they created animals too I said here is the evidence and of course no reply uh, how how is some old guy talking that's to do with this gentleman down here because uh, it considered evidence by blah, blah 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 and I says you're too funny show me the evidence where my evidence is wrong I'll wait and here's the evidence and I give the link of course no reply and you're getting the picture now I'm just gonna keep going through these just to finally shut people up because I do get fed up yes but TikTok evidence is very different to real evidence every video blah 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 and I said no problem watch this till the end and tell me where it is wrong and then I give the link to the evidence I'll show you where the evidence is in a second. Uh, up and uh, sorry, up and down means timelines. That's because this gentleman here said that the Anunnaki went up and down, and obviously we've got the original text that say they go up into space, which is heaven, and back down. And so I offer the evidence there with the link, and of course they don't bother getting back to me. No one ever gets back to me. 
Uh, he's talking realms, not physically. Think of shrinking infinitely or expanding. This is what another one says. Uh, and I kind of say, no, we have the text. Uh, would you like to see the evidence? And if you click on there, they don't ask for the evidence. Oh, you can share. Sorry, I did share actually on this one. Uh, but obviously they didn't ever get back to me, which is seems to be the case. So what I'm saying to you, if you've been sent here because I've told you that, you know, to go here, you ain't going to have the evidence. Sorry. Uh, this person says, no, it's not correct. Gods of Olympia, I'm guessing that's Olympus, have created this bloodline. And I show, said, please show me the evidence of what you said. I'll wait. They don't show me. No one ever shows me. Uh, this one here, whatever they said, the only creator is God. And I said, no, their race name is God. Happy to show you the evidence. Of course, they didn't want to know. They didn't come back and say, yes, please. <laughs> they never do. They never do. God is the creator, always was and always will be. And I've wrote, been debunked, which he has, because you can watch my evidence. And then I wrote, evidence for the gods of the anarchy. Happy to show you. And uh, then they wrote the usual one, who created that? you know, the Anunnaki, which is a stupid question, because I, I could then say, who created God? And they'll say, no, God's always been here. Well, then I can say, the Anunnaki's always been here. Don't make up crap. Go by evidence. And, of course, chemicals created species. If you don't know that, go research. Uh, we were created by God. I can, say, wrote, I can show you the evidence. We were created by aliens. Would you like to see this? And, you know, when you click on it, basically, no, they don't ask. That was me there saying that. So they don't ask. No one ever comes back. No one does. Uh, this person's put a little slappy face as if to say I'm talking crap. Happy to show you the evidence if you want. You click on that. They never come back. This person actually just said that I'm showing merely pictures, insignificant evidence. They didn't even watch it. They didn't even watch it. So, uh, and you, I wrote, I, you assumed I was going to show you pictures. <laughs> Um, and then I wrote, you're not the smartest here, <laughs> but I can show you evidence. Do you want to see it or not? And of course they don't. And this just goes on and on and on. For all my videos, I get people saying stuff and I'm like, happy to show you the evidence. And they don't want to see. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. And this is one of the videos that's got evidence. So this is a 10 minute video, part three of uh, four parts. There's hours worth of evidence on my Patreon page, but... There's 40 minutes on TikTok. This has got 17,000 views. Uh, and uh, as you can see by the other one, I do keep the, the silly comments. Um, but no one out of all of these comments here said I'm wrong and no one's backed it up with evidence either. So when I'm sending you to this video to watch, it's because you are not going to be able to debunk this video here. And if you're interested in where it is, it's around one... 136 so part 1136 um so at the tops of videos it's got like that one's 1142 so just scroll down until you see 1136 and then it's uh four videos after that so basically it says um uh proof the anarchy was called part two so basically you can guess the idea part one part two part three so please Enough with whatever you've just sent me because you're not you're going to be one of these people that just disappear. Sorry. I've been putting up some audio clips from books. These two books here, Black Ops, Alien, Spirits, Bigfoot, and Untold History, and Atlantis, Mermaids, Giants, etc. They're big books. Um, and people have been asking me what else is on the books because in the books. So I thought I'd go through uh, Ancient Earth. So this is this first book here, Black Ops, Aliens. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, ancient Earth, Ancient Moon and Mars, I mean these books are amazing, Anarchy, Egypt, Dinosaurs, Man, Bloodline, Little Green Men, uh, Souls and Spirits, Black Ops, Secret Program, Crop Circles, Other Aliens, Men in Black, Time Travel and Remote Viewing and Bigfoot and other information and this one has Mermaids, Giants, Bible, Ancient Sun Structures, Pixies, Bermuda Triangle, Levitation, Skinwalkers, Telekinesis and Telepathy, Atlantis, Vampires, Werewolves etc., Dowsing and ley lines, synchronicity and coincidence, hypnosis and the future. Highly recommend these amazing books.